For God's sake, stop pacing about, Percy. You're making me quite ill. How much longer? Until George arrives. He's on his way up. And what on earth can Smiley contribute? I would value his opinion. This is my operation, damn it. It's nothing to do with George Smiley. He's been away far too long to get involved at this stage anyway. Nevertheless. This is between you and me. At least it should be. I am your director of operations. Please, And Percy. yet you denigrate everything I do. What rubbish. Everything. If you're too blind to recognise gold when it's put before you, that's not my fault. Fool's gold. <coughs> It's a long time since we had material as good as this. Perhaps that's what worries me. Come in. Oh. May I? Uh, come in, George. Come in. Uh, thank you. Hello, George. How was the flight? Oh, not too bad, Percy, thank you, though I wouldn't mind catching up on a little sleep. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry to drag you straight off the runway, George, but this is important. We, that is, my director of operations and I, would like your opinion on the nonsense in the yellow file there. <laughs> oh, what is it? A Soviet naval dispatch. Mm. It's an appreciation for the Soviet high command of one of their exercises involving the Black Sea Fleet. Mm. Who made the translation? That's not important. At least, according to Brother Percy, it isn't. Well, whose are these initials? Zharov, Admiral Black Sea Fleet. I see. Shouldn't it be dated? Well, it's only a draft. Zarov signed it last Thursday. The finished dispatch, with the amendments you can see, went out on Monday. Yesterday? Exactly, George. But uh, where on earth does it come from? Percy? Brother Percy doesn't feel free to enlighten us. It looks quite interesting. The, ah! What do our evaluators say? They haven't seen it. And what's more, they're not going to. This report is far too sensitive for our own internal evaluators, you see, George. However... Lily of naval intelligence has been allowed to give a preliminary opinion over pink gins at um, the Shabbos Club, was it, Percy? At the Admiralty. Wherever. Brother Lily was excessively fulsome in his praise. He's already asked if he might apprise his fellow sea lords of its conclusions. Out of the question. It was for his eyes only. The stuff is so hot, you see, George, that it has to have time to cool off before it can be distributed. Well, where does it come from? Tell him, Percy. You're going to enjoy this. Source Merlin is highly placed, with access to the most sensitive levels of Soviet policymaking. We have dubbed his product Witchcraft. Not the we, George, the royal we. Yes, but who is we? Who's the case officer? He won't say. Will you, Percy? Now ask him why he won't say. <clears throat> Go on, George, ask him. All right. If you want it out in the open. Source Merlin is the fruit of long cultivation by certain people in their service. People who are not at all amused by the stench of failure that persists in this organisation. Oh. There have been too many scandals, too many operations blown. And nobody seems to care. By nobody, he means me, George. Let's face it, no one worries about Moscow anymore. We're all so damn busy spying on each other. The first principles of good security have all gone to the wall. We're losing our livelihood, damn it, and our self-respect. I'll take that file, George, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, but we're fed up to the back teeth. Well, perhaps we could talk about it, Percy. Well, what was all that about? The first public reading of Percy's political manifesto. <laughs> <coughs> Are you all right? <coughs> Doesn't matter. <coughs> Percy's trying to lead a palace revolution. And he's nailed his colours to these witchcraft reports. You mean this isn't the first? Oh, good God, no. It started just before you left for Canada. And they're all good stuff, according to Percy's friends at Whitehall. I see. Oh, yes, they're all very pleased with Percy. They've even encouraged him to set up a special witchcraft committee. In Whitehall? Here. Inside the circus. Be warned, George. The long knives are out and getting sharper by the minute. But how can Percy possibly set up his own committee? He can't, officially. But unofficially, who's to stop him? Has anyone agreed to sit on this committee? Oh, yes. Percy has his followers, never fear. Who? Bland, Hayden, Esther Hazen. Ah. Just the three of them. Allerlein's acolytes. A pack of jackals waiting for me to die so that they can feed off my bones. <coughs> ah, steady, steady. <coughs> I will not... Bequeath my life's work to a preening parade horse. That man would sell his mother for a knighthood. Talk to them, George. You know them. You know what makes them tick. Yes, but what do I say? Anything you like. Just find out what's made them turn their coats. I don't care what you say. 
But buy them back for me, George. I need time. Just a little more time. Number nine, you said, sir. Thank you. That's four pounds on the clock, sir. Thank you. Keep the change. Thank you, sir. George, darling, hold on to him. What? A taxi, hang on to him for me. Oh, would you mind hanging on? All right, oh. Oh, bless you, darling, I was beginning to panic. I'm desperately late. Uh, where are you going? Covent Garden. Got tickets for the ballet. But I've only just got home. I, I rather hoped we might have a meal together somewhere. Been such a long yes, darling, time. I know. But I was hoping that you'd have made it for lunch. Well, I'd, I had to go into the office. Tomorrow, so. perhaps. Well, uh, Covent Garden, please. Right. You know where everything is, don't you, George? Uh, yes, thank you. Enjoy yourself. Come in. George. Hello, Toby. Nice to see you. Always. But here in Acton, what a privilege. It's hardly worth a visit, but I haven't seen you for so long. Sure, George, any excuse. Yeah. Sit down, please, sit down. Thank you. It's just a small point. Tying up loose ends, you know. Sure, <laughs> sure. Now, uh, what sort of uh, loose ends, George? Well, the, the worksheets. Your lamplighters seem to be about two months behind. Mm hmm. Hmm. Perhaps we got no work, George. There must be someone in London worth watching. Or perhaps your boys have been doing some special jobs on the side. What sort of special jobs, George? Well, I don't know. Jobs you might not feel able to put down in the returns. I thought that was illegal. Not if you felt there were good reasons, good security reasons. Uh, who would I do a thing like that for? Percy Alleline, perhaps. Percy? Why Percy? Oh, why not? He is director of operations, after all. If he ordered you to do something and not record it, you'd be in a very difficult position. Uh, what sort of something, George, actually? Oh, I don't know. Uh, clear a foreign letterbox, prime a safe house, spike an embassy, anything. It's illegal, George, I told you. Even for Percy Alleline. You might think he was acting on instructions from above. Hmm. Uh, you want a cigarette, George? No, thank you, no. You don't mind if I... No, no, go ahead, please. Thanks. <clears throat> you know, George, I like this service. I can get quite emotional about it, actually. I have many other interests, many jobs I can enjoy doing, but I like the circus best. You understand me? Oh, yes. But the promotion is so bad, isn't it? Well... You know, George, I have all these years' seniority and I get actually quite embarrassed when all these young fellows expect me to take orders from them. Oh, which young fellows are these, Toby? George, listen to me. When you're overdue for promotion and working like a dog, everyone above you on the ladder looks young. <laughs> well, perhaps control could move you up a few rounds. I would have thought you deserved it. Well, uh, yes, control, but I'm... Actually, not sure he's able to do that anymore. Look here, I give you something for Anne. Mm -hmm. When I knew you were coming, I phoned a couple of friends of mine and asked for something a little perfect for a faultless woman. Oh, thank you. What is it? Perfume. Ah. You know, I never forget her since we met at Bill Hayden's cocktail. A truly beautiful woman, George. I think maybe you don't deserve her. Two and three is five. Ta very much. Thanks. Uh, and the next. You being served, sir? Excuse me, please. Thanks. Hand your backs. Oh, sorry, mate. Roy, uh, over here. Ah, well done. Is this all right? Well, it's a seat, isn't it? That's all that matters. G&T for you. Thanks. Well, here's looking at you, George. Cheers. Cheers. So, what's the deal? Well, there isn't one, not really. Uh, it's got to be something. Well, in a way. I suppose Control feels that the present situation is becoming unhealthy. What situation is that, George? I don't think Control likes seeing you mixed up in some sort of cabal. I don't think I do, Roy. Great. So what's the deal? What do you want? Well, how about a backhander out of the reptile fund, for starters? And a house? And a car? 
I'm not joking, George. At least I don't think I am. I've paid, you see. I don't know what I've bought, but I've paid. I've paid a hell of a lot. And now you want some back? Why not? It's the name of the game these days. You scratch my conscience, I'll drive your jag. That sounds like one of Bill Hayden's jokes about materialist England, the pigs in clover society. Well, why should you care? You're sitting pretty, aren't you? What more do you want? Well, George? I haven't managed to contact Bill Hayden yet. He's on leave. Ah. What about the others? I've had a chat with Toby Esterhousy and Roy Bland. And? Well, there would appear to be a distinct drift towards disaffection. They both seem to be nursing frustrated ambitions. And they see the witchcraft committee as a heaven-sent ticket to the fifth floor. Yeah, something like that. They're all jumping on the Allerline bandwagon, even the minister. Is there nothing you can do about it? I don't have time. Well, why not? You'll see. I've got something else for you to break your teeth on. Here. The last three months' reports from the Berlin residency. Damn near incomprehensible. Useless. Oh, tell Tomlin to pull his socks up. You tell him, George. What? Go out there and show him how to do it properly. He may need an older head. All right. I'll try and get out next week sometime. Tonight, George. I want you to go tonight. I want Berlin on its toes by the weekend. Well, what's the hurry? You're booked in the 8 o'clock flight. Tomlin will meet you at the airport. Is there something I should know about? Trust me, George. Just trust me. Hello, Bill. What are you doing here? Borrowing your wife, or trying to? Idiot. He's got two tickets for Covent Garden and no one to go with. Well, how nice of you to think of Anne. Do you mind, awfully, George? Only I know how you loathe the ballet. Otherwise, you can use the ticket yourself. I'll willingly stand down. No, thank you all the same, Bill. I have to go to Berlin. Tonight? I'm booked on the 8 o'clock flight. Well, in that case, I'd better go and pack a bag for you. Hmm? I said I'll pack a bag for you. Uh, thank you. How long will you be away? I'm not sure. A week, perhaps. Oh, well, you need a few shirts, then. Um, yes, please. I won't be long, Bill. What on earth are you going to Berlin for? I'm not quite sure. Control? Yes. Mm, if you ask me, he's barking mad. He's overworked, that's all. Not at all well into the bargain. Face up to it, George. The man's not ill. He's sick. Oh? And you know why? We've got a success on our hands, the first in years, and he's not part of it. This is Merlin you're talking about, Percy's source. Yes, and that's why Control doesn't like it. He thinks Percy's on the make. But of course he is. So am I. We all are. It's time I made something of myself, George. I want to be head boy. Does that surprise you? No. But as long as he's up there on the fifth floor, scratching away like a hermit with the clap, what chance have I got? What chance have any of us got? What's he doing up there, anyway? I didn't know he was doing anything, at least not anything in particular. So why is he ploughing through all our old case histories, all our accumulated disasters? Is he writing the definitive manual of failure or something? How did you come by that snippet of information? I've got a source on the fifth floor. Someone who exchanges indiscretions for an occasional box of chocolates. She hasn't by chance been indiscreet about Source Merlin, I suppose. No. Would be worth more than a box of chocolates to know who runs Merlin. Or who Merlin is. The wizard who made Arthur King of Britain, isn't he? <laughs> or rather, wasn't he? <laughs> yes, by God. And he'll make Percy King of the Circus if you don't watch out. Your bag's all packed, George. Thank you. You're meant to be expecting me. Yes? Jim Prido. Just push the door. Right on time, Jim. Come on up. Thank you. No problems? I wasn't followed, if that's what you mean. In here. Thanks. Ah. Nice place. Yes. Sit down. This, uh, is this one of your safe houses? Unofficially. The circus know nothing about it. Oh, I see. And everything I tell you here is for your ears only. Understood. Anything I ask you to do is not to be discussed with anyone, inside the circus or out. Is that clear? I report directly to you. And only to me. You must trust no one else, Jim. You can trust no one else. It's a pretty black picture. Blacker than you know. 
Do you still have a Czech identity? Hmm. Hajek. Vladimir Hajek. Czech journalist now based in Paris. Good. Good. I've had this offer of a service, you see. In Czechoslovakia? Yes. Czech general. Code name Testify. Real name? Stefcek. Hmm. Doesn't register. Next Friday, General Stefcek will be inspecting a weapons research establishment at Tisnov, near Brno. Some sort of boffin, is he? One of the new breed of artillerymen. Technocrat, yes. Ostensibly. In reality, he works for Moscow Center, with responsibility for dovetailing Czech intelligence operations against the UK with those of the Russians. Oh, big fish. Quite a catch, yes. After inspecting the weapons establishment, he'll be spending the weekend alone at a hunting lodge near Rachichi. Ah. My information is that he is prepared to talk to a representative of the circus. A Czech speaker, of course. And uh, what is he prepared to talk about? About us, Jim. The circus. The circus? About our catalogue of failures. Work it out, Jim. You must have wondered why so many of our operations have aborted just when they were about to pay rich dividends. Prague last year, that was one of yours, wasn't it? Uh, yes, Did but... you really put that down to operational inefficiency? Well, no, 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 no. Not Incompetence, really. then? Well, no, but we had problems. No it... buts, Jim. You were sabotaged. And you weren't the only one. You were betrayed. And you were betrayed by someone inside the circus. I don't believe it. We have a traitor in our midst, Jim. And that's why Stefcek wants to speak with us. He wants to sell us the name of Moscow Center's mole inside the circus. Hello, Charlie. Good God. Mr. Collins, isn't it? Ten out of ten. I haven't seen you for years, sir. I've missed you too. <laughs> Sign in, if you wouldn't mind, sir. Borrow your pen. Oh, sure. Yeah, uh, date's 19th, isn't it? That's right, and uh, time ends 11.57. Nearest makes no difference. Oh, thanks. Personnel still on the same floor? Uh, yes, but Control wants you to pop in and see him first. Control? If you wouldn't mind, sir. Well, I haven't even checked in yet. Well, he did say immediately you were right, sir. Very insistent he was, too. Oh, well. Fifth floor, isn't it? Come in. Ah, oh, sir. Come in, come in. Return of the Wanderer. <laughs> Feels a bit like that, yeah. Don't suppose you're sorry to be out of Ventian? Oh, it depends what I get next, doesn't it? What do you want? Well, they say the south of France is nice this time of year. A flutter at Monte Carlo, perhaps. Next week. What? I want you to take over as duty officer this weekend. I've only just got back. That's why, Sam. That's why. I don't get it. There's a special operation being mounted over the weekend in Czechoslovakia. I want someone here I can trust. Okay. I want no one to know that I'm involved. Not Bland, not Hayden, not Smiley, not anyone. Understood. You're to regard yourself as director of operations for the weekend. If anything comes in, a signal, a phone call, anything at all, bring it to me personally, by hand. If you say you do so. Do not phone me. You do not minute me for later. Everything person to person. You'll be here right over the weekend? Yes. But you're the only one that knows that. In other words, you're running your own show? If you like. It's more important than that, though. The whole future of the service may depend upon it. Duty officer. The foreign office, resident Clark. Sorry to wake you. That's all right. We've just had a call from the chief Reuters man in Prague. He claims a British spy has been shot by security forces. Thought you might be interested. Thanks. Damn control. Oh, shoes. Shoes. Oh, oh, now what? All hell's broken out in Teco. Don't tell me. Oh, it's all a bit garbled. There's so much radio traffic around Bruno. The Wranglers can hardly hear themselves think. Bruno? There's been a shooting there. One of ours, it's alleged. Duty officer. The foreign office, resident Clark again. Yeah, oh, God, Cassandra calling. Yeah, something like that, bro. Sorry. The Prague is now claiming that a British agent was shot and killed by Russian security forces operating in the vicinity of Bruneau. What the hell are the Russians doing there? Hunting for his accomplices, according to Prague. Any names? Negative. All right, thanks. Keep me posted. I'll reciprocate. Will do. Oh, hold the fort, Mike. I, I've got to report this. Hey, hang on. I'll be right back. Promise. Sam. Thank God. What is it, man? What's wrong? Everything. 
Someone's been shot in Cheko. Where? Where in Czechoslovakia? Somewhere near Bruno. The word is a British agent has been shot by Russian security forces. Oh. Russian? It doesn't make sense. Oh, it does. Oh, God, it does. What do you want me to do? Oh, God. Can I have a brief, please? They had foreign documents. No one could know they were British. It's not they. There's only one man involved at the moment. One man. So what do I do? Deny it? Look, I must have a brief. Yes. Well... Look, why don't I get get someone in? Smiley. Shall, shall I get Smiley in? He's away. He's in Berlin. Uh, shall I get him back? Hey, where are you going? Home. I'm going home. But it's your show, for God's sake. It's your show. I must go home. I must have time to think. Think. Hello, Sam. What are you doing here? Meeting you. What else? I'm honoured. Don't be. The way things are, it's good to get away from the circus for a while. I can imagine. And it gives me the chance to brief you on the way back. That would be very useful. Thank you. It was one hell of a night. I can't tell you. So I gathered when you phoned. Is there any more news? Jim Prido still alive, if that's any consolation. Jim Prido? Yeah. The first reports were that they'd killed him. What on earth was Jim doing out there, anyway? Waging war, by the sound of it. The Czechs had tanks deployed all along the border. NATO went to red alert. Good heavens. I tell you, it's like World War Three in the circus last night. Well, Control will have to be pretty quick on his feet. Control's disappeared, George. What? He went to pieces when the news broke. Walked out of the building. Hasn't been seen since. Who's minding the shop, then? Percy Annaline, for the moment. With Bill Hayden and Roy Bland plugging the gaps. What does Roy have to say about all this? Czechoslovakia is his territory. Oh, he didn't know anything about it. Well, surely. He... No one did, apparently. It was Control's own operation. He seems to have mounted it without reference to anyone else. Well, that doesn't make sense. Oh, you should hear Bill Hayden. He's telling everyone it's the most incompetent operation ever. Launched by an old man for his dying glory. Yes, well, Bill's bound to be upset. He recruited Jim Prido into the circus. I didn't know that. I wonder what's happened to Control. Keeping his head down, if he's got any sense, till it all blows over. <laughs> Wish I could do the same. Why? You weren't involved in the operation, not directly. Of course not. But six to four, someone will see fit to sanitise the situation. They'll purge everyone within earshot of the event. I doubt it. Oh, come on, George. A few heads will roll before this business is over. The controls will be the first for my money. Yes, please. I have an appointment with Mr. Lacon at 4.30. Uh, ah, yes. Mr. Smiley, isn't it? Yes. I'll tell him you're here. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Smiley's here for his appointment. Good. Send him straight in, please. If you'd like to go in, Mr. Smiley. Thank you. Right on time, George. Come on in. Thank you. How's Felicity? The arm mended? No, it's pretty well, George, pretty well. She aims to be riding again next week. Oh, that is quick. Oh, too damn quick, if you ask me. But then, whoever listened to an anxious papa, eh? <laughs> Have a pew, George. Thank you. I've had a chance to talk <clears throat> with the minister now. Oh, good. I'm afraid he won't wear it, George. He won't have a witch hunt. Not at any price. I wasn't proposing a witch hunt, Oliver. Merely an internal board of inquiry. Well, Minister feels, and I'm bound to say that I agree with him, that such course of action would be unconstitutional. What's unconstitutional about it? There's enough evidence to suggest that this was never a straightforward operation. Indeed. And even a suggestion that Jim Prido may have been betrayed. Possibly. But the minister feels that no good and perhaps even positive harm would come from further investigation into the affair. I see. I'm instructed to tell you to cease your inquiries forthwith. So what am I supposed to do? Sweep it under the carpet and forget it? Well, Oliver? I know. And indeed, you have assured me that you were in no way involved in this unfortunate operation. Not at any time. But you were Control's man, George. 
I still am, Oliver. <clears throat> the minister is insisting that control should retire for his own good. Of course. He is not, as you know, a well man. Mm -hmm. The general consensus is that it might be preferable if you were also to take an early retirement, George. I see. I'm sorry, George. I really am most awfully sorry. How much do I owe you? Uh, that's two pounds on the clock, sir. Uh, just one moment. Um, there we are. Thank you. Cab! Oh, thank you, sir. I say cab! Good Lord. George Smiley. Roddy. My dear boy, how nice to see you yes. after all this time. What have you been doing with yourself? Are you getting in or not? Uh, no, I've changed my mind. Oh, be my guest. What a lovely surprise. I was just popping into the club. Excellent. We lunch together. Uh, no, really, I've just been stood up by some wretched press officer from Bongo Bongo Land. Can't say I'm sorry, mind. No. But I do so hate eating alone, don't you? I don't know. Uh... Splendid. A little tete-a-tete -tete over the tete de veau. What could be nicer? Uh, well, now, I want to hear everything, George. You must tell me about everything you've been doing with yourself. The little bird told me you had locked yourself up with the monks of St. Gallen studying medieval German manuscripts or something equally absurd. I do study German manuscripts, but in the comfort of my own home, which is probably even more absurd. Oh, it is, when you've such a delightful wife to distract you. Yes, probably. And how is the lovely lady Anne? Very well, thank you, Roddy. Good afternoon, Mr. Smiley. Hello, Tom. Can I take your coat for you? Hmm? Oh, please. I haven't seen you for ages, sir. Not since I retired. A year now, isn't it, George? They're rather more, actually. Oh, I dread retiring. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I know the feeling. <laughs> Here, you'd better have mine, too. Oh, thank you, sir. You fit, George? I think so. Nice to see you again, Mr Smiley. You too, Tom. I just hope they haven't let my table go. They can say what they like. But the circus is not what it was, is it, George? Well, things are bound to change. Indeed. But not necessarily for the better, what? I wouldn't know, Roddy. I'm out of it now. Well, again, Contreras' regime wasn't exactly crowned in glory, was it? Not in the later years. More wine, Roddy. Um, yes, thank you. Of course, you and Control were always very close, weren't you? Well... Uh, That's why you were thrown out, why Bill Hayden got your job. My job? Well, he is Percy Allerline's cupbearer, isn't he? Just the way you were once controlled. Well, what difference does it make now? Control's dead and I'm out to grass. Ah. The word is, oh boy, that Control's still alive. What utter rubbish. No, truly, George, he's been seen. Willie Andrew Warther ran into him at Joburg Airport. Ruddy. Control was cremated and his ashes were scattered in a garden of remembrance in the East End. I was there. I always knew that Willie was a bloody liar. It was nearly a year ago now. Control had been sick for a long time. Hmm. Well, that check fiasco was really the final nail in his coffin, eh? In more ways than one. Yeah. Somehow, I can never quite believe in Percy Allerline as chief, can you? I never really knew him as a force. A striver, yes. An envious casker hungry for Control's purple. But chief... What's his knack? White halls at his feet. Special Percy committees with funny names and restricted access. He always did have a reputation for being something of a politician. Yes, but who's deviling for him, George? Who's winning him his reputation? I have no idea. Come on, George, you must have. you, Mr. Smiley. No, mm. thank you. Uh, may I? Please. Sir? Mm, yeah, oh, thank you. I'll sign the bill, if you please. Right away, <clears throat> sir. So who is it, George? Who's the clever boots? Is it Bill Hayden? Roddy, I really don't know. But you and Bill shared everything once upon a time. It's been said. If it's not Bill, might it be Roy Bland, our shop-soiled hero from Redbrick? Oxford, actually. Roy's St. Anthony's. And your protégé, I seem to remember. Once, a long time ago. Esterhazy seems an unlikely eminence grise, wouldn't you say? Probably. Unless all Hungarians have crystal balls, what? <laughs> So if it's not one of them, George, and Control really is dead... He is. ...then who is there left except you? <clears throat> You're barking up the wrong tree, Roddy. I told you, I'm out of it. I really have retired. Sorry. 
That was really excellent, Roddy. A really lovely surprise. Oh, don't thank me. Thank our lords and masters. They owe you that much. Then thank you for being such a willing agent. <laughs> Your curtains, Mr. Smiley. Ah, yes. Thank you, Tom. There you are, sir. And uh, yours was the British War, wasn't it, sir? That's the fellow. Goodness, is that the time? Yes. Actually, if you don't mind, old boy, I ought to cut and run. Oh, please, Roddy, you go ahead. I'm in no hurry. I shall get a cab. Can I drop you somewhere? No, thank you. It's a nice day. I'll walk home through the park. Well, bye, George. Lovely to see you again. Enjoy the chat. Goodbye, Roddy. Be Anne. Damn. Hello? 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 Who's there? Don't shoot, George. Peter! What are you doing here? Nicking your scotch. How the hell do you know there was someone here? You missed a marker in the door. There were two? I'm afraid so. My God, are you still that careful? Old habits die hard. Yes. Sorry about letting myself in like that. Where's Anne, by the way? In America. Good. That makes it easier. Makes what easier? Look, what is all this about, Peter? I'm acting under instructions, George. Very specific instructions. Which are? To take you to our Lord and Master at the Foreign Office. Oliver Lacon. No less. He's your Lord and Master, not mine. Not any longer. He wants to see you, George. My instructions are to take you to him. Well, that hardly warrants breaking into my house, surely. Uh, yes, I'm sorry about that, but Lakin is adamant. No one at the circus should know or even suspect that I've made contact with you. Hmm. Well, George? All right, Peter. Good. We'll hang on till dark and then leave. In that case, perhaps you ought to bring me up to date. I'm told things have changed quite a bit since I left. And apart from that, everything operational is under one hat. London Station. Bill Hayden's head of station, Roy Bland's his deputy, and Toby Esterhazy runs between them like a toy poodle. And Percy Allerline presiding like the sun in splendour. <laughs> yes. And where do you fit into this whole new concept, Peter? I don't. My previous associations with one George Smiley made me about as welcome as a pimp at a policeman's ball. <laughs> Percy made it clear that I was lucky to have a job at all. What job did he give you? Head of scalp hunters out at Brixton. Jim Prideau's old job? In name only. What news of Jim Prideau, by the way? He's in quarantine. Been a bit of a political embarrassment ever since we got him back from Czechoslovakia. Poor Jim. After all he's been through. Yeah. It's getting dark. I think we ought to be on our way now, George. Where did you leave the car? Oh, it's just round the corner. Uh, where you wouldn't spot it. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Is it my imagination or are we heading in the wrong direction for the Foreign Office? Lakin lives in Berkshire, doesn't he? Ah, yes. We are being very circumspect, aren't we, Peter? No, we're being bloody careful. I don't want to force the issue, but if we're being that careful, I think it's time you told me why. Do you remember a man called Tar, Ricky Tar, one of my scalp hunters? Oh, yes. I remember Ricky. I had to vet him for recruitment to the circus. I didn't know that. He was gun running out east somewhere, and the Jakarta resident, uh, now who was it? Steve McElvoy. That's right, it was Steve, who found him drunk on the dockside and thought he was likely material. I had doubts, I must say. I still do. Anyway, about six months ago, we got this flash requisition from the Hong Kong residency. They had a low-grade Russian trade delegation in town, and one of them was stepping wide in the nightclubs. They wanted a scalp hunter to make a crash approach, buy him or burn him. I should think that was right up Tar Street. That's why I sent him. He flew out the next night with an Australian car salesman's identity and two virgin Swiss passports sewn into the lining of his suitcase. Hoping the Russian preferred to be bought. Yes. And did he? No. A few days later, Tar cabled no sale and booked himself on a flight home. He didn't make it. And you haven't heard from him since? Not officially. The housekeepers gave him a few days' grace and then posted him AWOL. And Bill Hayden's been bending my ear ever since. So, where is all this leading, Peter? 
Tar turned up out of the blue three days ago. He came straight to me, thank God, and not to anyone else. As soon as I heard his story, I rang Lakon at his home. Tar's there now. At Lakon's house? There was nowhere else, George. We had to keep him under wraps, away from the circus. So no one else knows he's back in England? No one. Except for the babysitter, of course. A man called Fawn, one of my people. Peter, all this has happened since I left the circus. Yes. So why am I being involved? I'd rather Lakon told you that himself. You know, Peter, that moments like this, darkness can be something of a blessing. Well, how do you mean? This house, quite monstrous, isn't it? Well, not my stuff. Anne used to no. call it the Gothic Camelot. <laughs> I thought it quite out. It's <laughs> very... Ah. Well, well, hello, you two. Hello, hello, Oliver. George, how good to see you again. It's been well, how long now? It's quite some time. Indeed it has. Well, now, come on into the warm, won't you? There's a nasty nip in the air. Mm. Uh, Peter? Oh, thank you. <laughs> How's uh, retirement suiting you, George? Oh, well enough, thank you. Here, yeah, let me take your coat. Thanks. Am well, is she? Very well. The last I heard from her, she's in America, you know. Yeah? Yes, California. She's visiting a cousin there. Ah. I expect Peter told you why you're here. I sketched in the background for him. I thought he'd better let Tar tell his own story. Yes, it's probably best. Can I get you a drink, George, before we start? I don't think so. Well, sure, I can't tempt you. It may be a long night. Well, later, perhaps. Peter? Uh, no, no, thank you. Then you better come on through. He's, uh, he's in here. Hello, Mr. Smiley. Ricky! Long time no see, sir. All right, Vaughan, you can go. Very good, sir. Ricky's been a naughty boy, see, Mr. Smiley. He can't be trusted without a babysitter now. Well, I'll be right outside, should you need me, sir. Right. Do sit down, everyone. Make yourself comfortable. Thank you. Where would you like me to sit, Mr. Smiley? Uh, where you were, I think, Ricky. And, uh, Oliver, if we sit at the table with Peter. I'm not staying, George, if you don't mind. I've... I heard Tar's story twice already. As you wish. I'll see you're not interrupted. And if there's anything you need, just give a yell. Thank you, Oliver. So what happens now? You tell your story to Mr Smiley. What again? Why not? You should be word perfect by now. I would prefer to hear it from you, Ricky. Straight from the horse's mouth. All right. Where do I begin? I know why you were sent to Hong Kong. So let's start with Boris, shall we? Right then. Boris Kravchenko, born in Minsk, 1946, according to his visa application. And ripe for the picking. Right, Mr. Gillam? According to Hong Kong station. Bollocks. Begging your pardon, Mr. Smiley. He was a centre-trained hood, trailing his coat for a mug like me. What makes you so sure? Everything about the guy. It didn't add up. All day he was trailing around inspecting factories, the usual trade delegation routine. Then every night he was out on the town doing the night spots. And I mean every night. The local watchers were absolutely knackered. Hmm. As soon as I laid eyes on the bloke, I knew it was bad news. To start with, how did the guy manage to get away every night? There's always a couple of gorillas on these jaunts who were supposed to keep the boys out of the flesh pots. And the way he was pushing foreign currency around... Small-time trade delegate doesn't have that sort of currency. Not normally. On top of that, he had too much trade craft. Oh? Boris was a pro, Mr Smiley, no question. It was written all over him. So you decided to abort the operation? Mm, I cabled no sail and booked myself on the next plane home pretty damn quick. And then forgot to get on it. The plane wasn't leaving till the next day, was it? So I sort of... Well, I thought I'd burgle Boris's room. Why? I had to do something, Mr. Smiley. Go on, Ricky. The Russians were booked in at the Alexander. It's a ramshackle old gin palace down in the Marble Road. Mm. Anyway, I got into Boris's room, no sweat. And I was just standing there, getting used to the dark, when this woman starts talking to me. From the bed. Boris's wife. I doubt that. They'd never let them both out of Russia at the same time. A common law wife. Unofficial, but permanent. Ah. Well, you can imagine it. <laughs> Threw me for a minute, finding her there. But you thought of something. You know me, Mr. Smiley. Mm. I'm not an amateur. I had a fallback story. 
I told her I was looking for Boris. A very ingenious. I played it like a quiet Aussie going ape because he'd had his girl and his money stolen by a lousy Russian who couldn't afford to pay for his pleasures. And she bought that? Only because she wanted to. I think she guessed who I... what I was from the start. But she was at her wit's end. She was in tears, in fact. And there was no one else to talk to. And you appearing in her bedroom in the middle of the night was the answer to a maiden's prayer? If you like, yeah. You see, Mr Smiley, she told me there was nothing between her and Boris. They couldn't stand the sight of each other. He was out boozing and chasing the birds all night while she was sat in her room crying her eyes out and getting slowly plastered. So when she found a tall, dark stranger standing by her bedside, she just clasped him to her bosom and wept on his shoulder. Ricky does tend to have that effect on women, don't you? I suppose. Irina was a plain kid, a bit blue-stocking for my taste. But she had a hell of a pretty smile when she stopped crying. And she was ready to unpack. There was gold in her, Mr Smiley. I just knew I'd struck gold. I don't suppose it crossed your mind that... Uh, Irina, was it? Yeah, Irina. Uh, that she might have been playing a double game. <laughs> and suckering me into a honey trap. It's been done before. No way. The setup was all wrong. Oh, she was genuine. I staked my life on it. I believe you, Ricky. Yeah, well... Anyway, things just went from there. We met every day after that. And did she unpack? Not straight off. But I was damn right about Boris. He was the lead and Irina was the backup. Uh, his and her act. That's right. He was on the trawl for Hong Kong businessmen. Had a post box job on the side for the Soviet residency. She ran courier, boiled down the microdots and played radio for him on a high-speed squirt to beat the listeners. She told you that? Yeah. <laughs> she was convinced I was a colonel of intelligence. Mm -hmm. In the end, I got her family history, her recruitment, training, Moscow Centre, her lousy marriage, the lot. She was a bit in love with me. My God. She knew a hell of a lot about the circus. Oh? She kept on and on about Percy Alleline. Alleline? Said she had to talk to him. She had this secret, you see, this one big secret, and she'd only tell it to Alleline. No one but Alleline. Didn't you find that rather odd? Not really. It was the price of her ticket, wasn't it? She was ready to defect, in other words. Well, the way I see it, that was her only way out. Yes. Yes, it probably was. Hmm. Anyway, by that time, the official schedule for the delegation only had three more days to run. Then they were going back to Moscow. You were running out of time. Damn right I was. I crashed into the Hong Kong residency and put them on red alert before they were properly awake. Stood them, too, while I coded up a most urgent message to London on a one-time pad which I burned as soon as the transmission was complete. So you were the only one who knew the text of the message? In Hong Kong, yes. And the message? It gave an outline of Irina's career to date. The jobs she'd held at Moscow Centre, her access, all that. It asked for full defector treatment, an RAF plane to get her out the works. I see. And I asked for a message to be passed on to Mr Gillam here, that I'd landed on my feet and wasn't just playing hooky for the hell of it. I never got that, Mrs. George. Not a word. How oh, very odd. Who did you send this message to, Ricky? I gave it the London Station Address Group and graded it flash by hand of officer only. Uh, that's the new formula for maximum limit. It's supposed to cut out the handling in the coding rules. Hmm. You said Irina had this one big secret. Yeah. Was it mentioned in your message? I sort of hinted at it, yeah. How exactly? I mean, what form of words did you use? Do you remember? It was something like, claims to have information crucial to the well-being of the circus, but not yet disclosed. Thank you. <clears throat> Go on, please. Well, I hung around the residency for the rest of the day, waiting for an answer. When nothing had come through by that evening, I cabled a flash follow-up. Was it acknowledged? Oh, sure. We read you. Stop. That's all. Nothing more. Not until noon the next day. There I was, sitting on the hottest property for years, and London let me sweat it out for more than 24 hours. Mm. And when they do come through, all they do is stall. How do you mean? Bloody stupid questions, like what sections did Defector work in? When inducted into Moscow Centre? God, you'd have thought she was applying for a work permit. Who signed London's cable? 
No one. A normal practice these days, George. Outsiders deal with London Station as a unit. I see. Anyway, I drafted off a reply and shot off for a three o'clock meeting with Irina. But she didn't show. We had a fallback for half an hour later. She didn't show there either. I went round to the Alexandra. The Russians had checked out. No reason given. So I took a cab to Kai Tak and checked flight departures. There'd been nothing, absolutely nothing, that could have been routed through Moscow for two days. So they were still in Hong Kong? Uh, wait, George. Well, I've got this um, contact at the airport, one of the Chinese hostesses. She told me an unscheduled Soviet plane had taken off just two hours before. Four people bought it, and one of them was an invalid, a woman, in a coma. They had to carry her out on a stretcher. And they'd wrapped her face in bandages. Poor little cow. Well, perhaps she was ill. It is possible. Perhaps she really was in a coma. I wish I'd never sent that bloody cable. Maybe the security guards found out about your little affair and removed her. Yeah. She might even have told Boris about it herself, taunted him with it. These things happen. I know. Especially if she'd been drinking. Yeah, yes, I've jumped through all those hoops, Mr Smiley, over and over again, but it won't wash. It didn't then, it doesn't now. Look, can I have the cassette player in now, Mr Gillen? Yeah, sure. I'll go and get it, George. Irina <clears throat> was giving me so much dope on Moscow Centre. Her training, trade craft, the setup on the Soviet residency in Hong Kong, and God knows what else, that I was having trouble taking it all down. So I, uh, I, I bought her one of those miniature tape recorders, sort that fit in a handbag. I've handed two tapes to Mr. Gillam already. Now, here we are, Ricky. I'll leave you to work it, OK? Well, now, Mr. Smiley. Irina and me, we had a couple of dead letterboxes. So, after the business at the airport, I checked them out. You know, just in case. Mm -hmm. This is what she left me. One tiny little tape. The last will and testament of Irina Chernyshova. Quality's not brilliant because this isn't the original. Oh? He copied it and put the original back in the dead letterbox. I had my own welfare to think of, right? The Moscow Centre might not cut his throat if they thought he hadn't heard the tape. Seems a reasonable working hypothesis. OK. Here goes, then. Oh, and uh, she calls me Thomas all the way through. Uh, Thomas was his Australian identity. Thomas, listen to me. This is my gift to you in case they take me away before I have a chance to speak with Zalaline. I would give you my life, Thomas, my body, naturally. But this is all I have. Use it well, Thomas. Tell it only people who you trust. And do not trust anyone inside what you call circus, because no one, no one can be trusted until riddle is solved. So who could I trust? For two years before I was attached to trade ministry, I work as a supervisor in filing department at headquarters in Dzerzhinsky Street. That's Moscow Center she's talking about. Mm, I know. Oh, God, work was so boring, Thomas. Atmosphere not happy. Although I was not married. In same department was Evlov, as clerk. He was blonde, Thomas, like you. And I wanted him. He admired me very much, too. We worked many time night shift together. We begin to meet also outside the work secretly because he's against regulations. She was having an affair, OK? Forgive me, Thomas. Sometimes only our body can speak for us. You should have appeared in my life earlier. We used to go also to the room of Evlov's cousin, who was teacher at Moscow University. No one else was present. It was in teacher's apartment that Evlov told me of great conspiracy. Perhaps make himself very important, very, I don't know, very masculine to me. Perhaps also to hold us together with his great secret. Uh, we come to a new day. Uh, she kicks off with a lot of good morning Thomas's uh, love talk prayers. I've marked the place here somewhere. 
She was a very religious woman. Funny, isn't it? You don't expect it in a commie. Boris has gone out early, so she's got a bit of time to herself. OK. Please. Mm -hmm. Thomas, have you heard of Carla? Who hasn't? Carla is the most mysterious man in Moscow Center. Even Russians do not understand the meaning of such a name. He is a head of Directorate 13. He was, was very nervous to tell me this story, very frightened. He told me he once worked for Carla in secret capacity, very, very secret. Now we can't do it. Ivlov was stationed to London Embassy under cover of being driver and assistant coding clerk. But he had all the second job, work name Lapin. He was secret assistant to Colonel Grigory Viktorov. Viktorov at London Embassy had work name Polikov. His cover is Polikov cultural was attaché. Yeah. Uh, just a minute. He was secret assistant to Colonel Grigory Viktorov. Viktorov at London Embassy had work name Polikov. Stop it. His... P-O-L-Y-A-K-O-V. Is that right? Polyakov. Near enough, I should think. OK, to go on. Please. I was cultural attaché. To organize lectures to British universities concerning cultural matters in Soviet Union. But he, he is also from Directorate 13. And his true job is to serve as British mole called name Gerald. All right so far? Yes, thank you. Go on. Mole Gerald is object of deep conspiracy, Thomas. And do you know why? Can you guess? Wait for it. It's because... Mole Gerald has penetrated deep inside British Secret Service. That's what we call circus. This is why you can trust no one, Thomas. Do you understand? One of the most important men in your circus is a Russian spy. Depressing time of the year, don't you think? I've never given it much thought, Oliver. No, you wouldn't, I suppose. One season must seem much like another in Chelsea. Yes. <laughs> I'll be seeing the minister first thing. I think I should put him in the picture. Hmm. Don't you? I suppose so. Well, he must be told, George. We're to believe Tar and what we heard on that cassette. The Russians have a man in the circus. I don't see how I can avoid telling the minister. Yes. Oh, why the devil did that wretched Russian woman have to choose a man like Tar? Because he was there, I suppose. Fortunately for you, I would have thought. Hmm. You believe him, then? Not entirely. Tar's probably playing some little game of his own on the side. Yes, I must admit that the same thought crossed my mind. It's always been the trouble with Ricky Tar, knowing where to draw the line. Doesn't that make him rather unreliable as an agent? In some ways. But he does seem to have a way with women, and I am inclined to accept the main thrust of his story. Now, the Russians have penetrated the circus. You think Mole Gerald does exist? I think it would be most unwise to assume that he doesn't. Indeed. We can't move, then. The circus can hardly investigate Tar's allegation without alerting the Mole. If there is one. Quite. It's an awkward dilemma. Hmm. So, what do we do, George? You could call in the competition. Never. Oh, they are the experts. The minister would never wear it, and neither would I, for that matter. Damn it, George, we've got 600-plus agents in the field. I wouldn't give much for their chances once you turn security loose. I wouldn't give much for their chances with the Russian mole inside the circus. That's the crux, isn't it? I say again, George, what do we do? What would you do? My first priority, I suppose, would be to see if Ricky Tarr's story stands up. And how would you do that? Well, even if Ricky Tarr couldn't invent a story like that out of nothing. Somewhere there will be evidence that will corroborate or contradict it. All you have to do is find it. Yes. It's a fairly routine process, Oliver. And time-consuming, of course. Yes. So, 
I can tell the minister you'll do it, can I? Me? Oh, it's your legacy, George. Your generation. You can't just abdicate that responsibility. You discharged me from that responsibility, Oliver, remember? Uh, yes, yeah, yes. I'm out of it now. But don't you see, George, because you're out of it, you're untainted. You're the only person I can trust. Hmm. What happens if Ricky Tarr's story does stand up? Have you thought about that? We can cross that bridge when we come to it. One step at a time. Well, George. Very well, Oliver. That's settled, then. Excellent. Let's go back inside, then, shall we? I've taken that time, aren't you, Mr. Gillen? Are you surprised? I'd have thought Irina's story was clear enough. One of the top guys in the circus is a Russian mole. Period. It's not that easy, Ricky. Sorry to have kept you waiting. That's all right. I've got nowhere else to go, have I? Uh, well, yes, you have, actually, if you don't mind. What do you mean? Uh, we'd like to put you on ice while we check up on a few things. Yeah, well, you be damn careful where you go poking your nose. Ta! Yeah, well, it's not your head on the block, is it? We'd like to move you to a safe house for a while. How safe? Well, safe enough. Fawn will go with you. I don't need a babysitter. You do, Ricky. I insist on it. You can keep an eye on each other. Yeah. You're in charge, then, are you, Mr. Smiley? It would seem so, yes. All right, then. When do we start? As soon as possible. Before you go, Ricky, perhaps you'd just clear up a couple of points for me. Sure. All this business in Hong Kong. Yeah, what about it? It was over six months ago. So? Well, what have you been doing since? I flew out to Kuala Lumpur pretty damn quick. I've got a daughter out there, Danny. Danielle. I shacked up with her and her mother. He's got women scattered halfway around the globe. Yeah, but only one kid. Hmm. So what made you choose this particular moment to come to us with your story? I think I would have preferred to stay with my daughter, but then I don't have one. There were rumours. What sort of rumours? Some Frenchman poking around in KL, spreading it about that I owed him money. And? I don't owe anybody money. I see. What passport have you been using, Ricky? British. In the name of Poole. Do you want to see it? May I? I had it run up in KL. I chucked my Australian identity as soon as I landed. That's quite good, isn't it? That's not bad for the money. Not bad at all. And what about the blank Swiss passports, the ones you took to Hong Kong? Why didn't you use one of those? They may have been blank, Mr Smiley, but they were still numbered. If London had the numbers, maybe Moscow did too. Then what did you do with them? Sold them, most likely. Or swapped them for that one. I burned them. You burned them, I see. Yeah. Well, is that everything? I think so, Ricky, for the moment. He's lying, George. I don't know. Well, you can't possibly believe that nonsense about burning the Swiss passport. No, he's holding something back, obviously. But I would have thought the rest of the story was far too complex for someone like Ricky Tarr to invent. Someone else might have invented it for him. And turned him? It's possible. Ricky said he sent two cables from Hong Kong, didn't he? Three. The original on the morning of the 10th of April, the flash follow-up the same evening... Ah, yes. ...and his reply to London's questionnaire around lunchtime on the 11th. They would have been logged at this end, wouldn't they? Oh, yes. There's no way around that. Where would those logs be kept? In the duty officer's room, same as ever. Then I'm afraid I'm going to ask you to stick your neck out, Peter. No. We have to check those logbooks. Things have changed since your day, George. I've been banished to Brixton. I can't just walk in and out of the circus as I please. Not anymore. I'm sorry. You'll just have to invent some reason for a visit. All right. And make it watertight. We don't want to arouse suspicion. So you don't want me to actually steal the logbooks? A sight of them would be enough. All we need to know is, were task cables ever received? And if so, by whom? It would have been outside normal office hours. Hong Kong time is nine hours ahead of us. Yes. So it might be worth checking the janitor's rosters, see who was actually inside the building that night. Uh, two nights. A better still. I'm sorry to load all this on your shoulders, Peter. But you're the only one with legitimate access. Understood. Where will you be? At home? For a while, but don't contact me there. The phone may not be secure. Where then? Do you remember Mendel, the special branch man we worked with on the Fennon case? 
Well, that's playing back a bit, isn't it? He'd have retired by now. He has, it? yes. He's keeping bees now. <laughs> from a semi-detached in Mitcham, would you believe? <laughs> How do you know that? Oh, we've kept in touch. Now, the point is, I phoned him from Lacon's before we left. And? He'll be our clearing post until I've settled in somewhere. I'll give you his phone number. I've got it here somewhere. There. Yeah, thanks. I want an operational HQ for this job. Actually, Mendel's already suggested a small residential hotel he knows. Suitably discreet. Oh, yeah. In fact, I'm hoping he'll have it all sorted out by the time I get back from Oxford. Oxford? Mm. Well, why are you going to... Uh-huh. Doesn't Connie Sachs live in Oxford now? At the bottom. Where else? Be quiet, Hello, Connie. George Smiley. How are you, Con? You lovely darling man. Come in. Come in. Thank you. Quiet, flush, you stupid boy. It's all right. No. It's not every day my oldest, oldest lover comes to see me. I brought this for you. What is it, you old sinner? Only sherry, Tom. <laughs> we'll see if it's any good then, shall we? In here, George. Thanks. Basket, Flush. Basket. There's a good boy. Here, George, you can deal with the bottle. Of course. I'll see if I can find a clean glass for you. No, don't worry about me. Oh, you can't let me drink alone. Here. This looks unpolluted. Thanks. Here you are, Con. <sighs> oh. oh, God bless, George. God really bless. You too, Con. You too. I'm alone, have you, George? Except for the sherry. Bad boy. <laughs> well, there's no need to stand about, is there? Thank you. <clears throat> That's better. What do you want from Connie now? Just half an hour with the most priceless memory bank the circus ever had. Oh, damn you, George Smiley. Do you know what she told me when she threw me out? When who threw you out? The head cow in personnel. I mean, do you know what she said? No. You're losing your sense of proportion, Connie. <laughs> it's time to get out into the real world. I hate the real world, George. I like the circus and all my lovely boys. I got a letter for you here, uh, from Oliver Lacon. Oh, George, damn you, so how could you let someone like Lacon in? It was Lacon who let me in, brought me back in. Here, let me top you up. <laughs> Bad boy. <laughs> Fuel old Connie's memory bank. God bless. To you, Connie. Mm. <sighs> who is George looking for? One Viktorov, Colonel, first name Grigory. Viktorov. Thirteenth Directorate, one of Carla's hoods. Oh, sorry, George, it rings no bells with me. And that's got nothing to do with the booze. I know, Colin, I know. What about Polyakov, hmm? first name unknown? Alexei. Hmm? Alexei Alexandrovich Polyakov, cultural attaché, Soviet Embassy, London. You know him? Oh, yes. I know, dear Alexei. Jolly giant of a bloke. Lovely voice, too. I used to play the tapes twice just to hear him speak. Is he still around, George? Apparently. Busiest cultural attache in town. If you needed something in a hurry, a lecturer, a musician, you name it, Alexei cut through the red tape faster than anyone alive. How did he manage that? Uh, not how you think, George Smiley. Oh, no. 
Alexei Alexandrovich Polyakov was pure as the driven snow. You ask Toby Estes, or you ask Percy Adeline, ask any of ask them. Ask Phooey. He was a hood. A six-cylinder Carla-trained hood, if ever I saw one. All right, Con. I believe you. They wouldn't even listen to me, George. They wouldn't have listened to anyone, not even you. I didn't even know. Oh, you were on the down staircase yourself. Oh, please, don't go hunting with the Lacons, please. Why were you so certain Polyakov was one of Carla's people? I knew it the moment I laid eyes on him. Why, though? There was something about him. A ramrod back. He had army written all over him. And Carla always recruits his top men from the army. And what's he? more, the Soviet embassy already had three cultural attaches, and one of them had nothing to do but cart the flowers up to Highgate Cemetery for poor old Karl Marx. <laughs> Polyakov was surplus to requirements. Unless the real requirement was not for a cultural attaché. Ah, so what? You had him put under surveillance? On the A-list. Toby's lamplighters covered him at random, 12 days and 30. And? Nothing. He was clean, George, pure as the driven snow. You'd have thought I'd rung him up and warned him that Toby was turning his dogs loose on him. And then what? He was put on the B-list and checked out as resources permitted. But after three months of that, they'd still found nothing, so he was given the Persil grading. Investigated in depth and found to be of no intelligence interest. Dead end. Mm. It's all swept under the carpet and forgotten. Except by Connie. Remembrance Day, George. The Russian ambassador was laying a wreath at the cenotaph, and dear Alexei was there with a chest full of medals, and they were all military. I was so excited, I rang Toby at the house. Toby, I said, listen to me, you poisoned dwarf. Polyakov has at last let his ego get the better of his cover. I want him turned inside out, spike his house, his car, put the listeners on him, rig a mugging, anything, but do something, because it's a pound to a penny that Alexei Polyakov is running an English mole. Yes. Follows the Carla pattern, doesn't it? Of course it does. Colonel Komarov with the Japanese mole, Colonel Stoskowski with the West German. What did Toby say when you told him all this? Oh, he gave me his dead fish voice said they were satisfied he was clean and said if I wanted to take it further, I'd better talk to Percy Allerline. Hmm. I knew straight away there was something wrong. What, Carl? What could possibly have been wrong? They weren't interested, George. Weren't interested. And I thought it was just Toby at first, but it was all of them. You talked to Percy? Yes. What did he say? pleaded lack of resources or some such, accused me of unscientific deduction, told me to leave Polyakov alone. Leave him? You're losing your sense of proportion, woman. Time you went out into the real world. Oh, George. How could he? Damn. One of my young dunderheads come for his lesson, go and put him off until tomorrow, George. All right. Oh, be quiet, flash a silly boy. Shh. Is Miss Sachs in? Uh, yes, but I'm afraid she's not very well today. Oh. Uh, she's not very ill. Only a tummy upset. You've come for a lesson, haven't you? Yes. Can you come tomorrow at the same time? Is that all right? I should think so. I'll come back tomorrow, then. If you wouldn't mind. Bye. Ah, uh, that was Will, the best of my little dundads. We'll come back tomorrow at the same time. I still teach, you know. Oh, God knows why. <clears throat> have another sherry, George, I have. Don't overdo it, Con. Mm. There's always tomorrow. Tomorrow, it can help me forget. Today, it's helping me to remember. Dear old Alexei Polyakov. And all his military medals. <sighs> He was so good, George. So very good. He had to be Connor trained. Did he ever use a leg man? Why should he? He was a cultural attaché. I seem to remember Komarov had one in Tokyo. 
You're a sly old devil, George. You're the best of my lovely boys. Streets ahead of bloody Bill Hayden. You never really liked Bill, did you? What makes you say that? Bill and I get on perfectly well together, always have done. Yes, that's absurd. It's just a rumour. About Bill Hayden? Hmm. Makes it had a run around the park with Anne. Their cousins, Connie. No, it was nothing, George. It's just a silly rumour. Polyakov's leg man, Con. Did he have a name? Lapin. The rabbit. Clerk driver at the embassy. It was such a twerp that I didn't believe it at first. And then one day, Alexei flew off to Moscow and Lapin moved into the embassy until he came back. So Lapin was doubling up? It stuck out a mile, didn't it? You reported it? Of course I did. And what happened? Connie got the sack. <laughs> and Lapin went to Liberty Lop home. I don't suppose we knew him by any other name but Lapin. No. At the time, I suspected his real name might be Fluff. But I could never prove it. Penny for them, George. Hey, who? Did Connie give you what you came for? I think so, Con. I think so. Tickets, please. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi there. Hello, Mendel. Uh, have a good trip? Yes, not too bad, thank you. Fruitful? I think so, yes. Uh, come on, then. Where are we going? Just around the corner. I booked us into a little hotel in Sussex Gardens, the Islay. Very discreet and totally anonymous. Sounds ideal. It is. I've used it once or twice in the past. Uh, did you have a bag? I dropped it at the left luggage on the way out. Well, why don't you collect it now? I'll get the car and pick you up at the bus stop. Top of the stairs. Well, couldn't we walk? I'd rather not. See you in a couple of minutes. Hello, Mrs. Graham. We've arrived. Pope Graham, dear. And you're Mr... Oh, he's Mr. George. Mr. George. Uh, uh, yes, yes, that's right. I put you in number eight, dear. Top floor at the back where it's quiet. Thank you. That's what you wanted, wasn't it? Somewhere quiet where you could work. That's right. And I put you next door, Mr. Mendel. Perfect. Uh, what about the uh, desk for number eight? Norman put one in there for you. Lovely Georgian escritoire. Belonged to the Major, that did. He used to treasure that escritoire. I'll treasure it too, Mrs. Gra Pope Graham. I promise you. You do that, dear. Thanks very much. If the escritoire is not big enough for you, we've got a nice old Georgian card table. The Major used to use that sometimes too. Well, thank you, Mrs. Graham. Who was this major character she keeps referring to? Oh, right little con artist he was. But charming with it. Sort of bloke old ladies left things to in their wills. And what sort of things? Escritoires. Yeah, I wouldn't be at all surprised. <laughs> uh, number eight. This is you. Uh, not exactly the Ritz, is it? No, it'll do. Oh, there's the Escritoire. Victorian, I should think. Oh, very commodious. Uh, it needs to be. You should see the stack of stuff I've got for you in the car. Oh? Oh, yes, from Peter Gillam. A little background material. A little? That'll keep you busy for the next six months. Really? Oh, by the way, uh, Peter said to tell you he was going into the circus this morning. Oh? Huh? Yeah. Uh, he's uh, arranging to launder some money, if that signifies. It's as good an excuse as any. Hello, Mr. Gillum. Haven't seen you for ages. Uh, yeah, I uh, wondered about bringing my passport, just in case. Oh, it's not that bad yet. <laughs> uh, anyway, you're on the visitor's list uh, to see banking section, right? Lord of Strickland, no less. Uh, sit. Um, I'll phone through, tell him you're here. He'll probably meet you at the lift. Uh, third floor still, isn't it? Uh, hey, don't forget your pass. Oh, God. Thanks, Brian. And remind Mr. Strickland to sign it with your time of departure. Truth. I'll bring a pair of wire cutters next time. Well, don't blame me. I don't make the bloody rules. Greetings, Peter. 
Hello, Lorda. In a touch late, perhaps, but no matter. I don't qualify for reserved parking anymore, do I? Yes, at a premium now. Anyway, come on, let's not waste any more time. Good God. What's that? What? Oh, the coffee machine. Oh, we've had that for months now. You've no idea how many man hours it saves. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Oh, oh. sorry. Oh, my fault, Lorda. I was miles away. Hello, Bill. Peter Gillam, what the hell are you doing here, you old pariah? Peter's planning some move against the French diplomat needs to launder some dirty money, right, Peter? In a nutshell. Well, lock up the spoons, Lorder. Lock up the girls, too, if they let you. <laughs> Fantastic fellow, Bill Hayden. Incredibly able. Oh, yes, I know. Hey, just a minute. Since when did scalp hunters launder their own money? That's meant to be our job. It's Lorder that's doing the laundering. We're just spending the stuff. Papers to me, then, please, Lorder. You should have them already, Bill. Unless Roy Bland's sitting on them. OK. Just as long as we don't cross any more wires. You see, Peter? London Station couldn't be in better hands. My uh, office is just down here at the end now. Uh, look, perhaps I should just pop my head round Roy Bland's door, make sure he's got those papers. I mean, without London Station's stamp, there's nothing for us to discuss. Ah, point taken, Peter. Roy's office is round on the right, isn't it? About three doors beyond the duty office's room. Right? Uh, give me about ten minutes. I wouldn't mind a chat with Roy anyway. Fine. I'll, uh, I'll be in my office. All right. Now, the duty room. I'll see Roy Bland first. Can I help you? <coughs> Peter, how are you? Hi, Toby. What are you doing here? I, I thought I'd lost my pass. I'll never get used to using the damn things. No, I mean, what are you doing here, Peter? In the circus, actually. I'm still on the payroll, Toby. Haven't you heard? What are you doing? I was looking for Bill Hayden. I don't suppose you've seen him. He was down by the coffee machine a moment ago. Uh, might still catch him if you hurry. The one by the lift? Uh, you mean there are two of those monsters? Move, Gillum. Signal slogs. Signal slogs. Ah. <coughs> Fab. March, April. <coughs> ah. Sixth. Seventh. Eighth. Ninth. Strange. Sixth. Seventh. We should have heard from Peter by now. I'll give him time. He might have had problems. Mm. Look, tell me about my own business if you like, but uh, what are you hoping to get from the logbooks? Confirmation that Ricky Tower was telling the truth, at least about the cables he claims to have sent. Mm. A bit iffy, then, this uh, Tower character, is he? Oh, not exactly iffy. But he might bend the truth a bit. If it suited him, possibly. And if he's on the level? Then the logbooks will tell us who it was received Ricky's cables and what action they took subsequently. Gotcha. Six to four, that's Peter now. Oh, I do hope so. Hello? There's a Mr. William on the phone for Mr. George. Oh, yes. Yes, uh, put him through. It's Peter. Thank you. Um, hello? Peter? George, I've checked out the duty room. And? Every reference to the 10th and the 11th of April is missing. Missing? How do you mean? There's nothing in the attendance lists, nothing in the sickness log. The sheets for those two days have simply been abstracted in their entirety. But what about the duty officer's log? Same story. Only there you can see where the pages have been removed with the razor blade. And there's a note scribbled on the back of the preceding page which says, All inquiries to Head of London Station. I see. What's more, it's dated last Friday. And here's the punchline, George. It was initialed by Toby Esterhazy. Good morning. Good morning. You would be Mrs. Graham, I presume? Pope Graham, dear. Oh, I'm so sorry. Doesn't matter. What can I do for you? I have an appointment with Mr. George. Oh, yes. Mr. Oliver, would that be? That's right. Mr. Mendel said you'd be on time. Mendel? You want room eight on the top floor. Uh, thank you. I'll ring up and tell him you're on your way, shall I? Come in. Ah, Oliver, do come in. Uh, Mr. Mendel said you were expecting me. Ah, yes. Who's a devil's Mendel? An old friend. 
He found this hotel for me. It says much for his taste. And a lot for his discretion. But has he been clear, George? Is he secure? He's special branch. Well, X. Uh, I see. Would you like some coffee? No, thanks. I don't have much time. Of course. So, uh, is all this really necessary? All what? This secrecy. I'm being very careful. Which would suggest that you think the Tars' allegations may be true. Substantially, yes. The substance being that there is a Russian mole inside the circus. Yes. Well, you've obviously made some progress. Well, it's early days, but yes, I think so. Go on. You remember Ricky Tarr's account of his Hong Kong adventure? Vividly. And those three cables he sent to London Station asking for full defector treatment for his Russian girlfriend? Of course. Sometime in April, wasn't it? April the 10th and 11th. Ah, yes. Well, Peter Gillam has checked the circus records for those days. And? There are no records for those days. They've been removed from the log. Might there not be some legitimate reason for that? Yes, there might. Tar's Russian girlfriend referred to a Colonel Viktorov, work name Polyakov. A cultural attaché, as I recall. Indeed. A cultural attaché at the London Embassy, who just happens to be a military man. Which would suggest... That he is working direct to Moscow Centre's 13th Directorate. One of Carla's agents? Most probably. And if he is, he's almost certainly controlling a British mole. I see. And what's more, Polyakov used to have a leg man known as Lapin, whose real name was believed to be Iflov. Ah, oh, yes, the Russian girl's paramour. Now sadly deceased, I suspect. Hmm. What's that? A copy of a report. Part of the material Peter Gillam sent me as background reading. Blue means what? Internal circulation low grade. And therefore unreliable. Unconfirmed, but interesting nevertheless. Listen to this. According to a prisoner recently released from Moscow's Lubyanka prison, three state functionaries were secretly executed in the punishment block last July. One of the victims was a woman. All three were shot in the back of the neck. You think the woman was her inner? Yes. And I suspect the men were Boris, her partner, and Iflov, alias Lapin, her ex-lover. Yes. I know all this is circumstantial, Oliver. But it does seem to corroborate Tar's story. Yes. The point is that if Irina was betrayed in London, then the same might have been true of Jim Prido. Ah. I want you to reopen the file on the Prido affair. Do you, indeed? I need another line of inquiry, Oliver. We can't go much further with Tar's story. There are no loose ends left. There are no loose ends to the Prido affair either. I made damn sure of that. But there are, Oliver. I'm sorry. You merely swept them under the carpet. Not true, George. All right. Your minister allowed his new broom to do the sweeping for him. Percy Alleline has done extremely well. I mean, since he took over from control, he has won back the trust of his customers. He has produced intelligence instead of scandal, and he has stuck to the letter of his charter. And he has not, to my knowledge, invaded Czechoslovakia. Point taken. Hmm... Have you ever wondered why Control should have contemplated mounting an operation like that? It was completely out of character. We really can't start raking over all that again. There is a mole inside the circus. If you want me to find him, I must have access to any source of information, any source. And that includes the Prido file. George, you haven't got some personal axe to grind, have you? No, of course not. Very well. But if I do raise the file, isn't there a risk of alerting the mole? We don't need to raise it, Oliver. Only to re-examine it. Just tell us where it is. I don't know where it is. Just look at the time. I suppose I, I could go through my papers. If you would. There might be some indication there. I'll phone you here, shall I? Please, and from a public call box. Always from a public call box, if you wouldn't mind. Is that absolutely necessary? It would be wise. Well, uh, goodbye, George. Goodbye, Oliver. Thank you for coming. Oh, I... I, I beg your pardon. Yeah, sorry, it's my fault. Uh, I, I'll be in touch, George. Soon as you can. Come in, Mendel. Down. All well? Fine. He was clean when he arrived. Nothing on his tail, nothing on his conscience. Good. He had something on his mind when he left, though, didn't he? Yes, I should think Oliver Lakin's a very worried man. So what's your next move? I want to talk to a man called Jerry Westerby, a journalist. Never heard of him. I'm not surprised. 
He does most of his work behind the Iron Curtain and is a frequent contributor to the circus, if you understand me. Oh, Struth, you've got everyone out here, haven't you? It's called Living Your Cover. And how does Westerby fit in? I don't know. He wrote me a letter which sort of skated round the edges of the Prido affair. Didn't you follow it up? Well, I tried to, but Jerry was out of the country. And there I was fired. So, now you want me to start looking for this Westerby character? Oh, no. If he's in England, I know exactly where he'll be. Here you are, Mr. Westerby, sir. One doesn't look fine in a pint of liffy water. Lovely, Jimmy. Now we can begin to feed as the war is set. There's, um, there's a bloke just come and he's asking after you. Where? Far into the bar, a tubby bloke, polishing his specs. Good God. Is he OK, then? Of course he is. <laughs> hey, George! George! Come on over here, my old love. Hello, Jerry. <laughs> well, I'll be damned. Sit down, sit down. Thank you. <laughs> Have you eaten? Uh, not yet, no. Moist oh, steel? Very well. Another dozen log fine, Jimmy, and a pint of the black stuff. Um, I'd actually prefer wine, Jerry. Oh, a bottle of the widow twanky then, Jimmy, and I'll turn mine into a black velvet. <laughs> One dozen, a bottle of the velvet. Oh, welcome, old boy. Long time no see. A long, long time, Jerry. I haven't seen any of your circus performers for ages now, to tell you the truth. Oh? Now they've put me on the shelf, old love. I should never have sent you that letter. Well, I burned it as soon as I read it, Jerry. I didn't tell anybody about it. Oh, very decent of you, old boy. So it wasn't the letter that put you on the shelf, if that's what you think. Oh, no, no, I knew that. Oh, no, it was old Tobe. He's the one who put the boot in. Toby Esther, is he? That's why I wrote to you, wasn't it? Hmm. Well, what happened exactly? You only hinted at it in your letter. Oh, I didn't do anything else, did I? Shh, shh. Here we are. One dozen and a bottle of the bubbly. Right, Madame de Pompadour's platter. That's <laughs> what she ate every night before she got down to business, know what I mean? <laughs> bon appetit. Thank you. <laughs> it's the biggest thing uh, in the world. <laughs> I'll tuck in, old love. Mustn't keep the little blighters waiting. Mmm. <clears throat> mmm. Oh, bliss, absolute bliss. Mm. About this trip to, uh, where was it? Uh, Prague? Mm, Prague. Mm. I say, there's nothing on toward going on, is there, George? Oh, nothing sinister, Jerry. Just trying to put the record straight. Ah. You know what bureaucrats are like. <laughs> only too well, old boy, only too well. <laughs> so, why were you in Prague? To cover a UEFA Cup match. Duke of Prague. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. There's a bar I go to, a sport. A bit off the beaten track, but Stan, the barman. You know, Stanislaus, actually. Mm. Been a mate of mine ever since I took the Duke's goalkeeper in there a few years back. It's been the team watering hole ever since. Ah, yeah. I suppose that would make you a special customer. <laughs> and how, old boy? <laughs> Favourite son, more like. Anyway, Duke won, so there was a big celebration down at the sport. Stan got out his squeeze box and everybody was sitting sort of hugger-mugger around the big corner table, you know. Students, players, lots of pretty girls, you know the scene. Yes, I can imagine. And suddenly, this kid puts his arm round me like a long-lost brother. Starts showing off his English to impress his girlfriend. Which kid is that? Stan's nephew. Army conscript. Short back and sides. Apparently, he had to do his national service before he was allowed to go up to university. Is that right? More than likely. He was on leave, he was in love, and the whole world was his friend. Including Jerry. Oh, especially Jerry, old boy. <laughs> Jerry was playing for the booze, wasn't he? Ah, yeah. <laughs> well, to cut a long story sideways, he'd apparently been on some army exercise in the forests up around Breno. Usual sort of nonsense. When was this, Jerry, this exercise? Oh, uh, a couple of weeks before. End of October, I think. Thank you. The thing was that the exercise was scheduled for two weeks. Only they were pulled out after three days. Why was that? No reason given. Just orders. Clear out of the forest, go back to the barracks. The whole forest had to be cleared by nightfall. Didn't he have any idea why? Oh, yes. Because the Russians were coming. How could he have known that? Because he saw them. His unit had to pull off the road to let the Ruskies through. There were a load of motorcyclists screaming at him in Russian to get off the road. Then a staff car full of civilians. Civilians? Mm. Two truckloads of Russian troops, another truck full of tracker dogs howling their heads off. Unusual sort of convoy. Yeah, but definitely Russian, old boy. Absolutely definitely. Mm. The Czechs were pulled out to leave the field clear for the Russians. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. 
but that's only the half of it. Go on. The next night, the boys said his unit was piled into their trucks and tore around the countryside until dawn, signaling like mad as they went. No one knew what they were supposed to be doing or why they were doing it, but half the Czech army seemed to be on the move. For no apparent reason. The boy discovered the reason when they got back to Bruno. A British spy had tried to kidnap a general from a research station up in the forest, and the Russians had shot him. We seem to be talking about two nights, Jerry. Yeah. That's the whole point, George. The Russians moved in on the Friday, but they didn't shoot the spy until Saturday. In other words, they knew he was coming. Exactly, old lord. So why were the Czechs tearing round the country, creating an uproar? <laughs> That's a good question. A damn good question, actually. You say you passed all this to Tobias to Hmm. Well, I made a dead letter drop for him in Budapest on the way out. I told him the story when I reported back. And he read you the riot act? Oh, not straight away, old boy. Well, that was the strange thing. At first he was full of praise. Westerby for mayor, all that. Then he went back to the circus. And next day he was foaming at the mouth, screaming I was too pissed to tell fact from fiction. I see. A very odd sensation, that I don't mind telling you. Like watching somebody try to squeeze a toothpaste back into the tube. Good morning. Can I help you? Uh, Mr. George, please. Uh, room 8, I think it is. That's right, dear. You'd be Mr... Uh, William. Uh, just a minute. I am expecting you. Oh, yes, here we are. William. Funny. Uh, what is? Well, the, the way you've all got Christian names for surnames. Well, that's because we're all Welsh, see. Are you? Oh, yes. Valleys are full of Billy Williams and Evan Evans and the like. Really? Oh, yes. We've got whole rugby teams where everyone's got the same name. Go on. <laughs> How do they know who they're talking to? Well, search me, but you don't have to confuse the opposition. Uh, top floor, isn't it? Yes. Oh, thank you. I'll let him know you're here. Come in, Peter. Hi. You know Mendel, don't you? Uh, yes, of course. Hello again. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming so promptly, Peter. Do sit down. Thanks. <laughs> I'll fix you a drink. Uh, scotch, isn't it? Please, uh, with water. Right. Well, George? Peter, I think it's time to reopen the Prido file. Prido? How the hell does Prido tie in with Ricky Tarr? He doesn't, but he might well tie in with Mole Gerald. Ah. So we'd like to reopen the file. However, we seem to have one small problem. What sort of problem? Hey, not so heavy with the scotch. Come on, you can manage this. <laughs> You're not setting me up for something, are you, George? <laughs> As I was saying, Peter, we've come up against a snag with the Prido file. I had hoped Oliver Lakin would have something to show, but he phoned a little while ago. He has nothing on file about the Prido affair. I'm not surprised. All the papers will have been consigned to a dead file in Circus Registry by now. That's what I thought. We've got to get hold of that file, Peter. What he means is that he wants you to steal it. You're joking. He's not. George, they cut your hands off for that sort of thing. Come on, drink up. It won't help. But it'll make the pain more bearable, won't it? Oh, thanks. <laughs> OK, George. How do I go about stealing this file? I'm sure you've got it all worked out. I think so, more or less. Your first move is to dream up some excuse to get into registry. Well, that's no problem. Like I say, I need to dig out an old case history. Good. You'll need to make a preliminary recce, Peter. To find out which shelf the Prido file is kept on. Well, I should think it's still under its original title. Operation Testify. So all you want is the shelf number. Well, I can find that out by the morning. When you go back the next time... You're going to pinch it. Thanks. Take your briefcase with you, with a dummy file, with the Testify heading and shelf reference. Anything in the dummy? A few blank sheets, for appearance's sake. And you'll need a notepad in your briefcase and your address book. You leave the briefcase with the guard. I'd have to do that anyway. Security rules. Yes, yes, of course. Right. Then go into registry and draw a file. Any old file, as long as it's located near the testify shelf. Right? Uh-huh. Then you just swap it with the testify file. You take the testify file back to your table and work on it there. Then I phone you. You'll phone me. Why not? I'm your friendly neighbourhood car mechanic, aren't I? With urgent bad news about your lovely little MG. We've worked this out very carefully, Peter. 
They haven't put a phone in registry, have they? No. It's the same as in your day, George. All calls go through to security at the entrance. Good. So if Mendel here phones at a prearranged time, the guard will come in to fetch you? Almost certainly. And what would you normally do in that case? Well, I'd follow him out to the phone. With the file in your hand? Hmm. Normally, yes. You never leave a file unattended. And that's exactly what you should do when Mendel rings. You go out to the phone with the testify file in your hand, and I'll give you the bad news about your car. A broken half shaft, perhaps. Anyway, something you'd only get from the main dealer. Then you ask the guard... It is still Alwyn, isn't it? Usually. Hmm. You ask him to hand you your briefcase. Take out your address book. Give me the number of your main MG dealer. The real number? Oh, yes. And as soon as this Alwyn fellow goes back to his desk... Simply swap the testify file with the dummy in the briefcase. So the real testify file is in the briefcase, which I hand back to the guard. That's it. And I take the dummy back into registry. Yes, it should work. You'll have to get all the files back into their original places, of course. Of course. <laughs> it's a piece of cake. Yes? Peter Gillen for registry. Hang on. Hello, Mr. Gillum. Back again, are we? Yes, oh, I'm turning into a proper little bookworm, aren't I? Sign yourself in, if you please. Yeah, thanks. You know, in the old days, we used to do things in this outfit. Now we just sit around reading about it. <laughs> well, thanks, Solomon. Your briefcase, sir. Oops, sorry. Here you are. Thank you, sir. Here, I'm supposed to give you a number. Oh, don't worry. I'm sure I can trust you. Hello. Back again, Peter. Is there some sort of quota system in operation round here? Well, we don't see you for months on end, and then suddenly it's twice in three days. That's what all the girls say. Get on. How many registrations? Uh, two, please. Thanks. Two, eight, eight, four. Three, one, three, three. Thanks. D corridor. The two eights are halfway down on the right, and the three ones in the next alcove after that. Great. And don't forget to hand the counterfoils in when you leave. Will do. Three ones, next alcove. Three, one, three, three. Ah, yes, nice pink file. Now, where's testify? Ah, pink for pink. And I'm in... What the hell? What the devil are you doing? Uh, the radiators aren't working. Neither there's anyone else with that row going on. I'm sorry if I disturbed uh, It's you. all right. I, mean, I was told that this would be the best time to do uh, Yes, it. yes, all right. Yeah, Not your fault. Would you like a cup of coffee, Peter? A good idea. Sorry, Sal, I got wasted a little last night. The brain can't take sharp metallic intrusions. And I always thought you were a clean living country boy. I am. I am. Milk and sugar. Uh, please. Oh, and have you got the Warsaw telephone directory? They're up this end now. Bottom shelf, right-hand side. Registry door, Alwyn speaking. Oh, is Mr Gillum there, please? He's busy at the moment. Well, he'd give me your number. Set a ring him if it was urgent. Very well. I'll fetch him. Who shall I say is calling? Tell him it's Bert from the garage. Hang on a minute. Gillum? Mr. Gillum? Mm -hmm. Phone for you. Oh, damn. Sorry, they said it was urgent. D who is it, did they say? Bert, someone or other from the garage. Oh, Lord. It sounds ominous. Hello. Gillum here. Oh, hello, Mr. Gillum. It's Bert from the garage. Oh, yes, Bert. Uh, what's the problem? Bad news, Mr. Gillum, I'm afraid. The half shaft's gone. Oh, no. How long's that going to take, then? Well, that depends on how long it takes to get a new one, doesn't it? Uh, haven't you got one in stock, for God's sake? Right, not, Mr. Gillum. We'll have to get on to the main dealer, see if he's got one. Uh, wait a minute. I can give you the number of the manager's direct line. Uh, Charlie Pearson, he's a mate of mine. He'll pull strings if he has to. Just a minute. Uh, Alwyn, uh, chuck that briefcase over here a minute. Right away. Here you are, sir. Oh, thanks. Want me to open it for you? Uh, no. You might set the alarm off. I hadn't thought of that. Just bag it on the shelf here. Ta. I hope you get it sorted out, Mr Gillum. I'd better. Uh, 
Uh, won't keep you a minute, Bert. OK. Pearson. Uh, got a pencil, Bert? Yeah, shoot. Charlie Pearson, 9470563. Got it? 9470563. That's it. And tell him I'm desperate. I'll get back to you as soon as I know the words. I'd be grateful, Bertie, only I'd need the car this weekend. I'll do what I can, OK? Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah. Um... Bloody motor mechanics, they're all the same. <laughs> Here, you'd better put this back. Ah, Peter. Oh, Toby. I phoned Brixton, they said you were here. What can I do for you, Tobe? For me, nothing. But Percy wants to see you. What now? Immediately. We have a tiny crisis, actually. And Percy wants your opinion. Oh, one of those. Uh, hang on a minute. Um, Alwyn, would you put my briefcase on the next shuttle to Brixton? Certainly, sir. Uh, mark it for my attention. Will do. What about the file? Want me to take it back in the registry? Uh, no, thank you. Um, I'll put it back myself. Let Euler into it, Peter. Percy's waiting. <sighs> He'll have to wait a bit longer. Sally told me to put everything back where I found it. And she's a black belt judica, isn't she? I found him, Percy. He was downstairs. Well, bring him in, then. Sure, Percy. Come in, Peter. Oh, thanks. Find yourself a chair, Peter Gillum. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, right here, where I can see you. OK. Is this better? Hmm. We're just waiting for Roy and Bill, actually, Peter. They're on their way. Hey, what's all this in aid of, then? Just bear yourself in patience. Sorry. Ah, here they are. Ah, you found him, Toby. Oh, yes. I was right under your nose all the time, Roy. You should have told me you were looking for me. We tried to. Peter, what are you up to these days? Not a lot. A couple of Arab ploys that might be promising. Cy Van Hoffer may have a lead to a German diplomat. That's about it. No news of Ricky Tarr, I suppose. Ricky Tarr? He's your man, isn't he? Yes. So what? Well, how is he these days? I have no idea. I haven't seen him. You know that. Do I? What's that supposed to mean? Peter Gillum. Have you or have you not been in contact with Ricky Tarr? Oh, sure. We have tea together at the Ritz most afternoon. Don't try to be smart with me, Peter. I'm talking to you about a defector from your own section. I'm accusing you of consorting with him behind my back, of playing damn fool parlour games when you don't understand how much is at stake. Look, Percy, I haven't seen Tarr. I haven't laid eyes on him since I sent him on some damn fool errand to Hong Kong. So if anyone's playing parlour games, it's you, so get off my back. <coughs> Ricky Tarr has a daughter, hasn't he, Peter? Mm-hmm. Seems very attached to her, too. Does she have a name? Danielle. But Tarr calls her Danny. What about the mother? She's Eurasian, that's all I know. Unmistakably Eurasian, or could she pass for something nearer home? I've never seen her, but Tarr seemed to think she looked full European. Danny, too, for that matter. Twelve years old, long blonde hair, brown eyes, slim build, is that her? It could be. Danny and her mother were due to arrive three days ago at London Airport on the direct flight from Singapore. So, what's happened to them? Uh, delayed, miss their plane, changed their minds. How the hell should I know? Well, perhaps your information is wrong. It isn't. The source is extremely secret, Peter. It may sound like ordinary flight information, but it isn't. It's uh, ultra, ultra sensitive, actually. Well, in that case, I'll keep my mouth ultra, ultra shut, Toby. So, what do you make of this information, Peter? Why is Tar coming to England? Sorry, I thought you said it was Danny and her mother who were coming to England. Doesn't it occur to you that where little Danny is, Tar will not be far behind? Until now, it did not occur to me, no. Until now, Tar was a defector, right? He was supposed to be sitting in Moscow talking his head off, right? So what's he meant to be doing now? Redefecting to us? Redefecting will be a damn charitable way of putting it. Listen, Peter. Danny and her mother are travelling on fake British passports in the name of Poole, like the harbour. Tar's got one too. The well-known Mr Poole. That doesn't mean Tar's in England. He's already here, Peter. Oh? Huh? But we don't know where, actually. Our information is that he left ahead of Danny and her mother, travelling by a secret route. All right. 
The Russians have turned Tar around. They've sent his family over instead of keeping them in the bank. They've sent Tar over too, knowing that we won't believe a word he says. And suddenly, we're all going to be murdered in our beds. Oh, come on. I think it's time someone told me what the hell's going on. Never you mind what's going on. Peter, this really is more important than you can know. The first sniff you get of Tar or his lady love or his little daughter, you come to one of us. One of us four here. And no one else. Not another damn soul. I get the message. Good. As long as we understand each other. Roy? Oh, yes. For you, Peter. If you wouldn't mind. And what's this? Oh, you need a signature. Please. On the dotted line. Or thereabouts. OK. Oh, I certify that I've been advised of the contents of witchcraft report number 308. Source Merlin. Witchcraft? Merlin? What the hell's that supposed to mean? Never you mind what it means. Just sign it. And keep your mouth shut. Morning, Mr. Mendel. You're up and about nice and early. Old age, Mrs. G. Can't sleep the way I used to. I can't do anything the way I used to. Oh, go on. You're not that ancient. Says who? Mr. George up yet? Oh, yes. He had his breakfast over an hour ago. Oh, I'll be up to draw then. Uh, Mr. Mendel? Yeah? Everything um, to your satisfaction, is it? I mean, we're doing everything just the way you wanted it. Yeah, of course. Why? Well, uh, I think I'm due a, a little financial adjustment, shall we say. For the room. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I'll sort it out at the end of the week, OK? I'll make out a little bill for you, then. Come in. I've got something for you. The testify file. Ah. Duly nicked from the circus by one Peter Gillum. How did it go? Any problem? Smooth as silk, apparently. At least, until he put the phone down on me. Oh? He found himself face to face with someone he called Tiny Toby. Toby Esterhazy. Ah, Peter had finished the swap, thank God. Oh, that's a relief. What did Toby want with him? Well, he dragged Peter into an ear bashing session with a boss man, um. Percy Allerline. Yeah, right. Apparently, he knows Ricky Tars in England. What? Well, they suspect he's in England. I wonder how on earth they got onto that. Oh, something to do with Merlin, witchcraft, Peter said. Good Lord. Anyway, Peter wants a crash meeting with you. He'll phone through, well, could be any time now. Why? Well, he wants an eyeball to eyeball with Ricky Tarr. Hopping mad he was, I can tell you. With Ricky? Yeah, the bastard was lying about his passports. According to Allerline, Tarr, his wife, or whatever she is, and kid daughter Danny, are travelling to this country on fake British passports in the name of Poole. That was the name on the passport Ricky showed me. Yes, it is a fake. But how would Percy Allerline know that? I think that's what's worrying Peter. Well, that'll be enough. Yes, Mr. George speaking. Has Mendel spoken to you yet? Yes, just. I think we should talk to our mutual friend. Yes, it's something we must clear up before we do anything else. I'll pick you up, shall I? Please. Shall we say it's three o'clock? Fine by me. Where? Paddington Station. OK. If you drive in, down the side to the taxi drop-off point, I'll be waiting for you there. The drop-off point at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. See you then. Right on time, Peter. <coughs> OK? As far as I'm aware, but keep your eye on the mirror. Don't worry. Mendel told you about Tar. Mm hmm? Bloody fool could have blown our whole operation. Yes. Tell me about witchcraft and Source Merlin. Ah, they were just names on a piece of paper which Roy Bland made me sign at the end of the meeting with Percy. How was it worded, this piece of paper? Read like the Official Secrets Act. You know, I certify that I have been advised of the contents of witchcraft. Report number 308, Source Merlin. And then? Oh, the usual rhubarb. What was it exactly that they had advised you of? Nothing, except the flight information about Tar's family. Seems so bloody trivial. But it isn't, Peter. Don't you see? It means that their information comes direct from Moscow. Well, I'm sorry, George. I, I don't follow. Merlin is Percy's highly confidential source in Moscow. Witchcraft is the code name for the material he or she supplies to Percy. It's practically the whole basis on which Percy has built his reputation. No wonder Percy told me to keep my mouth shut. 
George. Mm -hmm. Doesn't this open a whole new can of worms? I've been asking myself the same question. How much further, George? We're nearly there. I think we want the next turning on the left, Peter. Yes, yes, this one coming up. Ah, got it. There. And that's the house up ahead. Mm, not bad. Whose house is it? Ailsa Brimley's. Good Lord. That's a name out of legend. Did you ever meet her? Uh, before my time. Brim was Jebedee's right hand during the war when she was young enough to be his daughter. <laughs> Though there were some who maintained that she was something else. Was she? I never asked. Come on. There's Brim at the door. I can see how the rumour started. Oh, yes. There was always a lot more to her than that, believe me. Hello, Brim. Hello, George. Nice to see you again. You don't know Peter Gillam, do you? Oh, by reputation. I rather think I'd left by the time they brought you in from the cold. Uh, nice to meet you, Miss Brimley. <laughs> Call me Brim. Everybody else does. Well, come in. Come in. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Brim. I hope all is well, your guests behaving themselves. No trouble at all, George. They've been very good, playing cards most of the time. And Tar hasn't been out alone. Oh, dear me, no. <laughs> I don't think Fawn would countenance that. He hasn't tried to phone out? Not as far as I'm aware. Fawn has a very steadying effect on Mr Tar. He has the same effect at Brixton. The others are very wary of him. He seems such a gentle sort of fellow. <laughs> I think that only makes it worse. <laughs> Can I get you something to drink? Or to eat, perhaps? No, thanks, Brim, really. We've got some pretty urgent questions we need answers to, if you don't mind. Oh, of course. You know where he is upstairs, the last door on the right. Who the hell's that? Who is it? It's me, George Smiley. May I come in? Just a minute, Mr Smiley. Hello, Fawn. Hello, Mr Smiley. Mr. Gillum, everything OK? Yes. Where have you been? I haven't heard from you for days. There's been a great deal of ground to cover, Ricky. A lot of loose ends to tie. Yeah, well, you be damn careful. You could be stirring up a hornet's nest. We're being very careful, Ricky. Very circumspect indeed. Well, mind you are. Anyway, what are you doing here now? We need some more information, Ricky. All right. Do you want me to leave, sir? Uh, no, stick around, Fawn. All right, George? By all means. Well, then, Ricky, these passports of yours... Which passports? The Swiss passports you took with you to Hong Kong. Yeah. You said you burned them. Right. What did you burn them with? <laughs> well, what the hell does it matter? Steady, Ricky. <sighs> yeah, yeah, all right. Ricky, we have to know the whole truth, not just the bit you want us to know. I told you I burned the passports. I didn't fancy the numbers. I reckoned they were blown. What about the British passport? In the name of Pool, was it? Yeah, that's right, Pool. Did you buy any other passports from the same source? Well, why should I? I don't collect the damn things. I just wanted to get out from under. And what about your little daughter and her mother? You wouldn't want to leave them behind to the tender mercies of... Uh, a Frenchman, was it? Yeah. The one who turned up at Kuala Lumpur saying that you owed money. Oh, all right, damn you. Yes, I... I got passports for Danny and her mother. Mrs Poole, Miss Danny Poole, so what? Now, why didn't you tell us that before? We would have understood. It's the most natural thing in the world to look after the people one loves. Or perhaps you didn't tell us because you were ashamed. Why should I be ashamed? Coming to England to all this VIP treatment, leaving them behind like that, at the mercy of that inquisitive Frenchman. Not a very gallant act, was it, Ricky? Not when you think about it. Maybe. Of course, it would be a different matter entirely if you'd burned the British passports and doctored the Swiss passports for Danny and her mother. That would make sense, wouldn't it, Ricky? You could make travel arrangements for them in the name of Poole, book them on a flight to England, perhaps, quite openly. So you'd be laying a false trail for London Station, the Russians, whoever it was looking for you. When, in fact, you had already used the Swiss passports to smuggle your family to somewhere safe, to somewhere like... Jakarta, I say. You bastard! George! You leave her alone, Paul! Leave her alone! 
Well, you are, Ricky, old son. You just sit quietly and get your breath back. All right. You all right, Mr. Smiley? Yes, thank you. I don't know where Danny is. Or her mother. You look after your own woman. Leave me to look after mine. That's enough, Ricky. What's that? Right. I don't know where they are, Ricky. And I don't want to know, believe me. Just as long as you don't try to communicate with them. <laughs> don't worry. It shouldn't be for much longer. A week. Less, if I can manage it. Try not to think about it too much. Penny for them, George. Hmm? Oh, oh, just going over what Ricky said again. Oh, <laughs> which bit exactly? You did most of the talking. That remark he made about looking after my own woman. You mustn't let someone like Ricky Tarr get to you. Tell me, was Tarr referring to anything in particular? Peter? I'm afraid he was, George, yes. I see. It was a long time ago, before you left the circus, in fact. And it still got as far down the line as that, to the likes of Ricky Tarr. Take no notice of him, George. He was only trying to get back at you. Yeah, I realize that. And what did this rumor suggest? Please, Peter. It was only a rumor. About Anne? And Bill Hayden. I'm sorry, George, really. Yes. Rick is quite fly, isn't he? He's bloody unstable and a congenital liar. Isn't that a roadhouse up ahead? Uh-huh. Why don't we stop and have a bite to eat? If you like. Everything all right, gentlemen? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. More coffee? Not for me, thank you. Sir? Uh, no, I'm fine. If you'd care to bring me the bill now, please. Right away, sir. You know, Peter, mm -hmm. the more I think about it, the more I have to admit to a sneaking admiration for our Ricky Tarr. Huh? No, 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 seriously. He's taken on London Station and Moscow Centre single-handed and fooled them both. Ricky's a fly, little beggar. You said it yourself. Oh, Peter, I think we both know why the Russians want to get their hands on Ricky Tarr. Oh, yes, to protect their mole inside the circus. But why, then, are London so anxious to get their hands on Ricky? Well, Percy seemed to think Tarr is really defective. At least, that's what he said. How can he be redefecting when he never defected in the first place? Well, we know that, George. Percy doesn't. Why not? If his source in Moscow told him about Tar's travel arrangements, he must surely have told him Tar wasn't a defector. It doesn't make sense, does it? Not yet, Peter. Not yet. Your bill, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, is there a public telephone I can use? Outside, by the main door, sir. Thank you. I promised to phone Mendel. Oh? Uh -huh. He's trying to trace some of the people who were involved in Operation Testify. Anyone in particular? Max Kodicek, for one. According to the file, he was Jim Prido's babysitter. Whatever's happened to old Max? I haven't seen him for ages. No one has. He hasn't worked for the circus since Testify. Oh, I see. Who else is Mendel after? Sam Collins. Sam? Mm. He was duty officer the night Jim Prido was shot. That's right. Sam got the push about three weeks later for drinking on the premises or something equally stupid. Amazing, Peter, isn't it? Practically everyone who was involved with Operation Testify is no longer working for the circus. Including you? Including me. Look, let me take care of the bill while you go and phone Mendel. Very well. Slay Hotel. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Hello. This is Mr. George. Is Mr. Mendel there? Oh, hello, Mr. George. Hello. No, he isn't. He's gone to get his car, but he left a message for you. Yes? Oh, just a minute. Mr. George? Yes? He'll be taking you to Hampstead in the morning. That's why he's gone to get his car, I expect. Thank you, Mrs. Pope Graham. Thank you very much. That's the place. Across the road. Block of flats. Max Kodichak works in the basement. 
contract parking. Yes, there might be somewhere down there where we can talk. Oh, if there isn't, bring it back to the car. And what about you? Oh, no mind about me. There's always things for me to do. <clears throat> like sit on that bench back there and read my newspaper. Okay, Max, take it away. Bring Jaggio up next. Right. I say, excuse me. Uh, just a minute. Any possibility of renting a parking space for a few months? Uh, what sort of car? Hey. Hello, Max. What do you do here? I want to speak with you, Max, in private. Sure. Sure. Uh, we go in the cabin. Uh, oh, Dicky. Yep. I, I just deal with this customer. You take over, huh? Okay. In here, please, George. <clears throat> Sit down, please, George. Uh, we can talk here. Thank you. You want some terrible coffee? No, thanks. <laughs> I just want to talk. Sure. We talk, then. About Jim Prido. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm not in it anymore, Max. Did they tell you? Nobody don't tell me nothing. They sacked me. Probably about the same time they sacked you. <laughs> what do you do? Steal money? I don't want them to know I came here, Max. This is private. Okay. You private, Max private too. Cigarette? No, thank you. Me mm, also. Try to give up. I want to know what happened in Czechoslovakia. Uh, I had no part in it, Max. Please believe me. Sure. Sure, George. I was in Berlin. I knew nothing, absolutely nothing, of the background or the planning for that job. Planning? Well, that was some planning, George. Some planning. Jim had some sort of special job to do, didn't he? He asked for you. I know he did. Sure. Was special job. Secret job for Czechoslovakia. Jim asked me to babysit. Ah. Jim say, take leave. Tell Toby Esther Hussey, Max got girlfriend trouble in Leeds. Toby say Max always got girlfriend trouble somewhere. He's right. So Toby knew nothing of Jim's mission? Nobody don't know nothing. Nobody allowed to know. His special, secret job. For control. For control, personally? Yeah. Yeah, personal. No one else. Did Jim say how long this job would last? Uh, three days. Secret conference in Rachichi. It's near Bruno. Yes, I know. Who was this conference going to be with? Don't know. Jim say only to meet him in Brno by football stadium. Max cross over from Austria by van near Mikulov. How was Jim going? Plane from Paris to Prague. Train to Brno. Only he was late. Oh? Sure. Miss Rendezvous may only fall back later. Did he say why? No. Say only plans were changed. Now Max must stay out of it. Must drop Jim short of rendezvous. Go straight to Bruno and wait till Monday. Okay? Okay. If Jim don't show up by Monday, Max go home, deny everything. Girlfriend trouble in Leeds. And if Jim does show up? If Jim show up, Max carry a message to control. And only to control. Not to contact Network Agravat. Not to contact Network Plateau. Not to contact Circus Residency in Prague. Especially not to contact Residency. Not to contact nobody except Control. And give him Jim's message. Sure. What sort of message would it be, did Jim say? One word. Message would be one word. What sort of word? Max don't know. Jim don't come. Come on, Max. Stop mucking about. Yeah, yeah, all right. Excuse me, George. Yes, of course. What the hell are you doing in there? Oh, shush. Sure, sure. Difficult customer, Dickie. Someone scratched paint on the Rolls Royce. Oh, God. It wasn't me, honest. Shh, shh, shh. Don't worry. Leave it to Max, huh? Okay. Okay. <sighs> so, something obviously happened to Jim on his way to that first rendezvous in Brno. For sure. So he made the fall back, and then what? 
We drive to Rachichi Road and find car. Fiat, black, no lights. Jim get out, say something to driver, code word, something. Uh, then get in car and drive up track, which go through woods. And then? And then Jim don't come back no more. Max, what happened to Jim? What the hell? Now, come on, Max. You hear these things. It gets around among you emigres. Come on, Max. You must have heard something. Yeah, sure, I hear... Uh, I hear they shoot Jim from behind, in back. He was maybe running, yeah? I hear they put him in prison. Yes, but how did we get him back? What did it cost? I tell what it cost, George. It cost Pribble. Pribble's wife. Pokova Mirek of Pribble's wife, the brother. Colin Kiri, also his sister. This was Network Agravat, now mainly dead. After Network Agravat come Network Plato. Come lawyer Rapotin. Come Colonel Lankron. Come typist Saver Kriglova. Hanka Pilova, also mainly dead. That's a damn big price for one Englishman when bullet in back, George. Perhaps it wasn't Jim. Perhaps someone else blew the networks. What the hell? Why you bother, George? Why you bother? All right. Yes. Well, I'm not sure, really. I've taken the registration number of every car within two blocks. So if one turns up on our tail, we'll know. Where to now? Next appointment. You've already traced Sam Collins. Well, there aren't that many really high-class casinos in town. Two phone calls was all it took. He's at the Rue Genoir, just off Grosvenor Square. Well, will it be open yet? It never closes, does it? Those people never give a sucker an even break. I'm going to need two more pieces of information fairly soon. Name them. One's a firm called Stroll and Medley. What do they do for a living? That's what I want to know. There's an invoice from them in the testify file for services rendered. It's a strange piece of unexplained trivia. That needs explaining. If possible. What else? The present whereabouts of Jim Prido. Full name? James Sheldon Prido. Any leads? I'll see if Oliver Lakin can conjure up some relevant background material, but... The politicians have rather swept him under the carpet. Right. We'll split at the Rouge Noir and I'll start putting out feelers. Hello, Sam. Good God. Can you spare me a few moments? Of course. Of course. We're going to the office. Fine. Well, what do you think of the place? Well, it's certainly impressive. And very profitable. <laughs> okay, George. Do you enjoy all this, Sam? Well, better than selling washing machines, isn't it? <laughs> so, what can I do for you? A few memories, bits and pieces, you know. Like what, for example? I'd like to talk about the night Jim Prideau was shot. You were duty officer, weren't you? Yes. What goes on? Are you writing your memoirs or something? We're reopening the case. We? Which we is this? Just me, with a little help from Oliver Lakin. Hmm. Nothing ever changes, does it? Coffee? No. Um, yes, please. Well, help yourself to a sandwich. I live off of one of the perks. <laughs> no, thanks. I'm happy with just coffee. The record's been filleted, Sam. I'm not surprised. There's hardly anything on file. It's a question of talking to the people who were involved. Help yourself to sugar. Yes, thanks. I know we talked at the time, Sam, but I never heard the full story. OK, George. Let's take it from the top. I just got back from a three-year stint in Ventian. I remember. I'd hardly walked in the door when suddenly I get this urgent summons to the fifth floor. From control? Yes. He wanted me to take over as duty officer for the weekend. Did he say why? He said he wanted an old hand on the switchboard in case there was a crisis. Someone who'd been away from head office for some time. I fitted the bill, I suppose. But he didn't explain why he wanted an outsider on duty. No. All I knew was that someone was doing a special job, a very special job, in Czechoslovakia, and I was to be the cutout between control and whatever else was going on. Which meant what, exactly? Well, whatever came in, a signal, phone call, however trivial, I was to whip it straight up to control. No middleman, 
No phone calls. Everything person to person. And where was Control? In his office. All night? Yes. Until the news of the shooting came through. Then he just went to pieces. He simply walked out of the building and went home. What did he say when you gave him the news? Nothing that made much sense. Well, he must have said something, surely. When I asked him about getting you in, he muttered something about you being in Berlin. Well, he sent me there. But that was it, more or less. Hmm. He just seemed to give up the ghost. I swear to you, George, he aged a million years that night. And he left you holding his baby. Oh, and how. It was sheer bloody pandemonium. NATO went to red alert, Whitehall was wetting his knickers, and everyone was screaming for information I didn't have. I was denying everything with one hand and trying to call in the top brass with the other. Which top brass was that? Well, there was Percy, you, Bill, Roy... Me? Um, yes. In Berlin? I didn't get the call. No. Well, I rang by Water Street. In case you'd got home early. So who did you speak to? Your wife. Do you recall how the conversation went? Uh, Anne's away just now. I asked for you, and she said you were in Berlin. That was all? I asked her whether, by chance, she knew where Bill Hayden was. It was urgent, George, and I heard they were cousins. They are? What did she say? She said she wasn't Bill's keeper and rang off. How did she sound? Distinctly shirty. Anyway, I was fielding fastballs for about an hour when in walked Bill. White as a sheet. What time was this? About 1.15, I should think. He said he'd picked up the story on the ticker tape at his club. Rather late for that, wasn't it? For what, George? A reading club ticker tape. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Not my world, is it? Anyway, when he turned up at the circus, I could have kissed him. I put him in the picture pretty damn quick. When I told him Jim Prido had been shot in Chekhover, he went bananas. Didn't he know about Jim? Apparently not. He must have read it on the wires, surely. The news was out by then. All I know is he was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. He took over the whole thing, firing broadsides all over the place at the Czech embassy. Sam. Yes? Bill was nowhere near his club that night, and you know it. George, He was I'm... at my place when you rang. No, but... As I... soon as you had put the phone down and pushed Bill out, and he rushed straight round to the circus. That's what you really think, isn't it? Look, George, what Isn't I... it? From the shoulder, Sam, please. In a nutshell, yes. Thank you, Sam. Come in. Ah, good morning, Oliver. George. All well? Very well. Can I offer you some coffee? Not just at the moment, thank you. Do take a seat, Oliver. Well, how much longer is all this going on, George? Until we find our mole. That is the object of the exercise, isn't it? Yes. I asked you to call in so I could bring you up to date. Good, good. Yes. I think we have established the salient facts about Operation Testify, Oliver. No. Uh -huh. We know Control mounted the operation entirely off his own bat. Indeed. And we know the operation was betrayed to the Russians, not to the Czechs. How do we know that? It was reported to London Station by one of our own agents. Hearsay, yes, George, it's pure hearsay. Well, agreed, Oliver, but worth following up, wouldn't you say? Well, uh, yes, but what will that entail exactly? If we want to get to the truth of the matter, I have to speak to Jim Prido. Oh. I'm afraid so, Oliver. Well, by all means, speak with him, if you can find him. Ah, yes. There was an oblique reference to him in the file we removed from registry. I'd rather not know about that. It seems Percy Allerline passed on an invoice to you from a Mrs. Stroll and Medley for services rendered. Stroll and Medley. Hmm. Mrs. Stroll and Medley specialise in providing supply teachers to preparatory and minor public schools. Supply teachers? In this case, a language teacher to Thursgood's school, which is just outside Taunton, I believe. You think that referred to Pritter? The service was rendered in May last year. Yes, the timing is about right. I thought it worth checking. What will you do? Just that. Check it out. 
Mendel's going to look over Thursgood School. He caught the first train down there this morning. <laughs> well tackled, you bones. Why aren't you playing, Jumbo? Please, sir. Oh, well, excuse games. I've had a cold. We could do with his weight in the scrum, sir, couldn't we? Damn right, shrimp. We're getting shoved all... shoved all over the place. Who's that, Jumbo? Who, sir? Over there. Looks like old Solomon Grundy. Who is he? Don't know, sir. Please, sir. I think he's something to do with the church. Church? Shrimp? What church? Please, sir. Our church, sir. I saw him talking to Wells Fargo this morning. And what did he have to say to the Reverend Spargo, eh? Don't know, sir. They were just looking at the pew lists. Sir. Our pew lists? Yes, sir. Those goods pew lists. With all the names, sir, where we sit. Was he now? Look, I think he's going, sir. Yeah, so he is, Jumbo. So he is. Up to no good, I'll be bound. You see him snooping around here again, you let me know, all right? Yes, yes sir. sir. Sure you'll recognise him again, are you? Yes, yes sir. sir. Colour of hair, Jumbo. Uh, sort of grey, sir. High shrimp. Sir, six foot, sir. <laughs> sir, everyone looks six foot to shrimp. Age, Jumbo, you toad. <laughs> Ninety-one, sir. There you scored, sir. Yes? Mr. Mendel's on the line for you, Mr. George. Ah, uh, thank you, Mrs. Pope Graham. Put him through, please. Hang on. Hello? Hello, Mendel. Any luck? It is, Prido. No doubt about it. Well done. He's not even using a false name. Well, what do you want me to do? I'll come straight down. There's a train at 4.30. Arrives Taunton around half past six. I'll be on that. Can you meet me? Of course. I've hired a car. White Rover. Good. And I think you should book a couple of rooms at a local hotel and get an invitation to our friend to visit me there. Reason for visit? Leave it open. Just my name, the room number of the hotel, at any time convenient to him. OK. See you around 6.30. Mr. Brito, Mr. Brito! Hey, eh? oh, What is it, Trim? Sir, it's a message for you, sir. Message? It's from him, sir. Old Solomon Grundy. He said to run and give it to you, sir. Did he now? Should I have said no, sir? Hmm? No, 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 Shrimp. Must always deliver messages. They might be important. Sir, I hope it's not bad news, sir. Well, let's see, shall we? <clears throat> yeah. Is it all right, sir? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, from an old, old friend. It's someone I haven't seen for years. Uh, that's good, sir. Yes, isn't it? You, sir. Rooms up there, are they? Yes, sir. Who was it you want, sir? 23, second floor, eh? That's right, at the end of the corridor. Right. There is a lift, sir. Come in. Ah, Jim, do come in, please. Ah. I'm so glad you could get away. Where's Solomon Grundy? Who? Six foot, sharp eyed, greying, looks like an emaciated greyhound. <laughs> it's my babysitter. Where is he? Downstairs in the bar. Sit down, please. Now, what can I offer you? Oh, the, uh, the malts will do. With water? <coughs> As it comes. When do you have to be back at school? Any particular time? Must be quite a change for you. Though you had a spell teaching once before, didn't you? Before the circus dragged you back. Look at my file. It's all there. Yes, yes, I'm sure it is. Is that all right for you? Hmm. The trouble with the file, you see, is that I was thrown out of the circus before they got you back from Czechoslovakia. And as Control's dead... Control's dead? Yes. Didn't they tell you? What did he die of? Well, at the end, I suppose it was a heart attack. But surely they must have told you that at your debriefing. Who got his job? You? No, I told you. I was thrown out long before you came back. Who then? Who did you want to get the job, Jim? Have someone in mind, did you? Don't play cat and mouse with me, George Smiley. I'm not one of your juju men. Who got Control's job? Percy Adeline. <laughs> oh, yes. I don't suppose they told you what happened to the Czech networks, either. What about them? You recruited some of them, didn't you? In the old days, before Roy Bland took over. God! Damn you, George, I've drawn a line. 
That's what they told me to do. Draw a line, make a new life, forget testify, forget everything. Which they is this? Roy? Bill? Percy? All right. What happened to the networks? They were rolled up. Oh. The story is that you blew them to save your own skin. I don't believe that for one moment. But I have to know what happened, Jim. I know control made you swear to keep silent, but that's over. Didn't now. anyone get out? I'm afraid not. Oh, for God's sake, let's go somewhere we can breathe. It was a trap, George. Control was set up. You know that, don't you? I guessed. Pull in here, George, will you? Very well. You say control was set up. Oh, well, they had a big surveillance operation waiting for me the moment I landed in Prague. Cars, pavement artists, backups, the lot. There were so many of them, they're tripping over each other. Is that why you didn't make the rendezvous with Max? How'd you know that? Well, Max told me. Oh, he's all right, by the way. Oh. That's something, I suppose. The meeting was a trap, too, presumably. Oh, yes. Half the Red Army waiting for me. Flares, fireworks, photographs. And the KGB for afters. It was a Russian trap, then. Moscow written all over it. Biggest sucker punch in the history of the trade. And Control walked into it with his eyes wide shut. I don't believe there ever was a general. Your meeting was with a general? Supposed to be. Russian? Czech. General of artillery, it is alleged. In reality, he was the Czech liaison officer at Moscow Center. Did he have a name? Hmm. Steph Czech. He'd apparently made it known to Control through, <laughs> quotes, a trusted intermediary. That he was disenchanted with his lot and ready to sell out. So what was this General Stefchek going to sell you? Defence material, rocketry, ballistics, that sort of thing. Nothing else? A more bit of politics. And that's all? George. Yes? The networks. How long were they in the bag before? You know. A lot longer than you were, I'm afraid. Dear God. Let's have a breath of air, shall we? and come up here, get away from things for a while. I can imagine. It's peaceful. Yes. That's the school down there in the hollow, isn't it? Hmm. Jim, mm. what was the bait? I've told you. Defence material, rocketry, ballistics. That's just the dressing. There was more. There had to be. I need to know, Jim. I want the nub of the matter. There are some things you push so far down, you can hardly find them anymore. I know. You draw a line under it all. Make yourself believe it never happened. So what was it that Control wanted from Stephji? What was it, Jim? What Stephji really wanted to sell us was the name of Moscow Center's mole inside the circus. You knew? We know there's a mole. We know his code name is Gerald. We're trying to establish his identity. That's what Control was doing. He'd, he'd been through all the old files, researching, cross-referencing. Somehow, by some process of elimination, he'd got it down to five suspects, five, uh, five possibilities, he called them. And Stefchek would name one of the five. Control gave me a single code word for each of them. That's all I had to get back to him. One word. Yell it down the phone. Chalk it on the embassy wall, anything. Go on. Oh, we used Tinker Taylor, you know, the old nursery rhyme. One name for each. One name for each. Percy Allerline was Tinker. Bill Hayden, Taylor. Roy Bland was soldier. Uh, oh, we skipped Sailor because it might confuse with Taylor. Ditto Rich Man because it sounded too like a name or a place. Poor man, then. <laughs> Toby Esterhazy. That's four. You said there were five possibilities. Yes. Beggar man was you, George. It's getting a little chilly, don't you think? Let's get back to the car. Will it be all right if I clear away now, sir? If you've finished. Uh, yes, please, go ahead. Thank you, sir. 
Oh, on second thoughts, leave the coffee, would you? Would you like a fresh pot, sir? No, this is fine, thank you. Morning. Hello, Mendel. I'll be with you in a minute, sir. Oh, that's okay. Well, you're up early, aren't you? Couldn't sleep. Oh, still worried about being on controls, hit list? More hurt than worried, I suppose. Though God knows I shouldn't be. The whole point of a mole is that he should be above suspicion. Yeah, well, you were obviously an afterthought. Can I bring some of your coffee? Hmm? Coffee. Of course. What makes you think it was an afterthought? Well, unless I got my matchsticks lined up all wrong, Control's list went in order of seniority, didn't it? Yes. Alaline, Hayden. Yes, you're right. So you would have been Tinker. Taylor, at the very least. Why didn't I think of that? Too close to home. The question now is, why the afterthought? Well, didn't you say Prideaux was close to Bill Hayden? Hmm, very close. They were at Oxford together. And Hayden's name was on the list. So you think my name made the list more acceptable to Jim Prideaux? Well, it's a fair assumption. You are being most perceptive this morning. Well, I've got a clear conscience, haven't I? Are you finished with the toast? Yes, help yourself. Ta. I'll tell you one thing. I reckon your Mr Prideaux could prove a very ugly customer if you ever got on the wrong side of him. Probably. He's a very powerful man, certainly. Or was. He had a rough time out there in Czechoslovakia. How long did he hold out? Days, weeks. I don't suppose he knows. Then why didn't the networks get out, if they had that much time? That's the whole point. They didn't have time. They were rolled up on the first night. Why? Ah, your mole, Gerald. Yes. Apparently, Jim was hardly questioned about the networks. The Russians just weren't interested. Then why hammer him? What they were really after was the extent of Control's suspicions, how close he was getting to uncovering their mole. Careful. Sorry mm. to keep you waiting, sir. Oh, that's all right, dear. A full breakfast, is it, or just the Continental? Uh, have I got time for the full? Easily. I thought we might try for the 9.45 back to town. Well, I'll have the works then, dear. Orange juice, mixed gruel, toast and marmalade. Oh, and uh, some more coffee, please. And your room number? Uh, 15. 15. Thank you, sir. If you'll excuse me a minute. Sure. I want to set up an urgent meeting with Oliver Lakin. If I phone now, I'll still catch him at home. I'll be right back. Ah, oh, don't rush. I may need a little time. Good morning, Mr. Oliver. Good morning. Come to see Mr. George, have you? Yes, is he in? Only just. His train was late. You know where he is? Yes, thank you. J just tell him I'm on my way up, if you wouldn't mind. Very well, sir. Come in. Ah, oh, Oliver, thank you for coming so promptly. Well, you made it sound so damn imperative. Did I? Well, yes, I suppose I might have done. May, uh, take a seat, Oliver. Thank you. Uh, you obviously have something of significance to tell me. Hmm. I've had a long conversation with Jim Prido, and, well, I know now what inspired Operation Testify. Ah. Yes. You see, Prido was sent to Czechoslovakia to meet a Czech general, a Czech general who'd offered to sell control the name of a Russian mole inside the circus. Good God. It went horribly wrong, of course. Control must have been out of his mind to even contemplate it. No, Oliver. Control was out of his mind with worry. But he knew what he was doing. Mm. Sadly, so did the Russians. What? They knew all about Testify. They must have done. So it wasn't simply mental aberration on Control's part? No. Control knew there was a mole inside the circus. According to Jim Prido, he'd narrowed the field down to five possibilities. Who, George? Who were they? Bill Hayden, Roy Bland, Toby Esterhazy, and Alaline. The top four? Yes. Who else? You said there were five possibilities, did you not? Yes. The fifth name on Control's list was mine, Oliver. You, George? I'm afraid so. No, no, I, I can't believe it. You have to believe it. I most certainly do not. Anyway... What? The Russian woman that Tar got mixed up with, the one who started all this... Irina? Irina, yes. She said the mole was inside the circus now. And you've been out of the game for more than a year. Yes. Well, then that's settled. You have my complete confidence, George. Thank you, Oliver. Be unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable. <clears throat> Now, this may seem almost ungrateful on my part, Oliver, but I'm afraid I'm going to put that confidence to the test. Go on. 
I presume that special source of allolines is still running. Source Merlin, was it? George, for God's sake. Now, don't worry, we're not bugged. That's why we chose this place. It's beneath suspicion. Well, uh, yes, since you ask, Source Merlin is still running and providing damn good material, too. And you still call it witchcraft? Yes. I need to see the witchcraft reports, Oliver. What? The reports, analyses, annotations, recommended actions, everything. I want them here, Oliver, where I can study them. Out of the question, George. I couldn't allow it. Because I was never on the witchcraft subscription list. You don't know what you're asking. Percy Allerline's on the list. Of course he is. It's his source. And Bill Hayden, and Roy Bland, and Toby Esterhase. All controls, four prime suspects, are witchcraft cleared. They've been on the subscription list since day one. You can't be serious, George. If Control's suspicions were correct, and one of those four is the Russian mole, then Moscow has known about Source Merlin and the witchcraft reports for at least 18 months and done nothing about it. Yes. Look, Oliver, I'm nearly there. There's just one last clever knot that I can't undo. And I know, I'm certain, it has something to do with witchcraft. I need those files, Oliver. Very well. But there's reams of the stuff, I warn you. I shall want it all. Well, if you say so, but it may take time. I'll, I'll see what I can lay hands on this afternoon and bring it in tomorrow morning, if that's all right with you. Oh, Peter, thank God. Problems, Elaine. Cy Vanhofer just rang in. Wants you to get in touch. He says it's urgent. Oh, isn't it always with Cy? Don't worry, I'll ring him now. Thanks. Gillum. Oh, hello, Mr. Gillum, sir. Uh, Bert here, uh, from the garage. Oh, uh, hello, Bert. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, I'm sorry to trouble you, sir, but we've just got the new speakers in. You know, for the car radio and tape deck. Oh? Yeah, I just wondered if you were still interested. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, of course I am. When could you fit them? Well, whenever you like, sir. The sooner the better. Only we're not too busy just at the moment. I'll drop the car in on the way home from work, then, shall I? Fine, Mr. Gillum. See you then. Hello, Mr. Williams, sir. Oh, playing at hotel receptionist now, are we? <laughs> oh, standing in for Mrs. Pope Graham. <laughs> She's making some more coffee and sandwiches for George. Ah, I just got here in time, then. Well, he hasn't moved out of his room for the last three days. He's not ill, is he? He will be, if he goes on like this. Lacon brings in a pile of documents each morning and takes them away the following morning when he brings the next pile in. I don't think George has been to bed for the last three nights. I'd better go on up, then. Yeah, tell him I'll bring the coffee up in a few minutes. OK. I dare let Mrs Pope Graham take it up. She'd throw a fit if she saw the state of his room. Come in. Ah, Peter, that was well-timed. George, this place looks like a pigsty. Yes, yes, I'm sorry about that. Here, I'll just clear these and you can sit down. <coughs> Thanks. Witchcraft report. I've had to wade through about 300 of them in the last three days. It hasn't left much time for domestic niceties. I uh, wasn't criticising, George. I wouldn't care much if you were. Not now. Ah. Peter, I'm beginning to see daylight at long last. It's all here. In the witchcraft report. It's hidden away, but it's all here if you know what to look for. Go on. One of the more interesting discoveries I've made directly relates Toby Esterhazy to one of the Russian cultural attaches. Polyakov? Whenever Source Merlin produced really topical witchcraft reports, either Polyakov was in London at the time, or Toby had taken a quick trip off to Europe. Mm. All expenses paid out of the witchcraft budget. It could be coincidence, George. Also, in the period immediately following Tar's adventures in Hong Kong, friend Polyakov was in Moscow for, quote, urgent cultural consultations. Wait a minute. That means that Polyakov is connected with Source Merlin and Toby Esterhazy. And probably to Mole Gerald. Ah. Oh. I think perhaps it's time we had a little chat with Toby. In private? Of course. Well, I hope I haven't kept you waiting, Peter. No, no, right on time, Toby. Come in. Thank you. I looked this place up, actually. It's not on my list of safe houses. No, it wouldn't be. We've only had the place a couple of weeks. 
I see. And you say you're meeting a German here, an East German in the fur trade, who might run courier for us. Right. He should be here any time now. In here, Toby. Thank you. Where did you find Hello, this? Toby. George, what are you... Hands doing? against the wall, What is Toby? this, Peter? What's going on? Sorry about this, Toby. You know I never carry a gun, Peter. Not in England. Did you come alone, Toby? Of course. It's OK. He's clean, George. No babysitter. To meet Peter and a poor German. Sit down, Toby. OK, OK. Oh, what's all this about? We want to tell you a little story, Toby. Are you sitting comfortably? Sure. It's about a man called Merlin. A veritable wizard who conjured up first-class intelligence material from so many different sources inside the Soviet Union that his product was dubbed witchcraft. Careful, George. Merlin himself is not a prime source. He merely collects this intelligence and passes it on to London. Please, George, you're treading actually on very dangerous ground. Then one day, Merlin finds he has a friend in London, a fellow conspirator. Let's pretend this friend held the post of cultural attaché to Moscow's London Embassy. I'm not listening, George. Let's pretend you are, Toby. And let's pretend his name is Alexei Alexandrovich Polyakov. I'm not hearing you. Having Polyakov on your doorstep was too good an opportunity to miss. Some of Merlin's material is smuggled to London by diplomatic bag, so all Polyakov has to do is slit open an envelope and pass the contents on to his counterpart at the circus. You don't know what you are saying, George. I know witchcraft is a large operation, Toby, a very secret operation. And the way the operation works here in London, that's a very special secret, isn't it? But you know how it works, Toby. You, Roy Bland, Bill Hayden, the three of you, and Alaline. You know, because you four are Merlin's magic circle. So how does it work, Toby? Well... Maybe I'm just keeping my mouth shut. Maybe you should too, George. So who handles Polyakov? You? Roy? Bill? All three of you, perhaps? Or even Percy? Let me sweat the bastard, George. George? What's the matter? Just looking. I thought I saw someone, something, moving in the shadows out there. If you're lying about those babysitters... I'm not, I swear to you. Cross my heart. Tell me, Toby, is Lapin a name which means anything to you? Sure, George, I know Lapin. What was Lapin's job over here? He was Polyakov's legman. But Toby, cultural attaches don't have legmen. Oh, don't be damn silly, George. Polyakov is working for Moscow Center, but he's our Joe. So he's got to pretend he's spying on us, huh? Yes, of course. How else would he get away with it? Exactly. He comes to our shop, so he's got to take home the goodies. So we give him the goodies, chicken feed, really, so he can pass it back to Moscow. This is not the first operation we run like this. No, you're right. So who is playing the part of Polyakov's agent, Toby? Come on, Toby. If Polyakov's cover for meeting you people is that he's spying on the circus, then he must, he absolutely must, have a source inside the circus. Mustn't he? I suppose. So who is this source? You? Toby Esterhazy, masquerading as a traitor in order to keep Polyakov in business. He gets my vote. Now, look, George, you're... You're poking your nose into things you maybe don't understand. No, no, seriously, Toby. You'd be a good choice. Hungarian ancestry, reasonable access, resentment about promotion. Likes money. With Toby Esterhazy as his agent, Polyakov has a cover story which really works. The circus gives you the chicken feed. You hand it to Polyakov. Moscow thinks Toby's all theirs. Everyone's served, everyone's happy. You damn bet they are. Ah, thank you. But you see the problem now, Toby, don't you? What problem? What if it transpires that Polyakov has been giving you chicken feed and you've been giving him the crown jewels? Where are you taking me exactly? Never you mind, Toby. George? A safe house, Toby. I'd like you to spend a few days there until this business has been cleared up. George, you surely can't be serious. A Russian mole inside the circus. It's too fantastic. 
We've always accepted that it could happen. Yeah, sure, it's a nice idea in theory, but there are two sides to everything. Indeed. I mean, whoever called witchcraft chicken feed? No one. It's the best. Not as good, I imagine, as you've been handing to Moscow. Oh, George. Via Polyakov. I think you have the wrong end of the stick. I'm a very patriotic fellow. I know, Toby, I know. But you see the way the circus is being turned inside out. Who's wrong? Who's right? George, listen. If you are wrong, I don't want to be wrong, too. You understand me? But if you are right, he wants to be right, too. Sure, why not? All I want, George, is to get this thing cleared up, you know? For the good of the circus. Thank you, Toby. I felt sure I could rely on you. Always, George, always. We're nearly there. Another ten minutes. Good. Where is there, this safe house? Just beyond Colchester. You'll be very comfortable. Oh, sure. Maybe I should call my wife, actually. Of course, you can phone her from the house. Better to phone the duty officer at the circus. Let him tell your wife. Would you do that, Toby? Whatever you say, George. Anything I can do to help? For the good of the circus. Audius? Uh, Phil, it's Toby. Hello, Toby. How's tricks? Uh, fine, actually. But I want you to do this favour for me. Yes? I've got a little problem, a personal problem I have to take care of, actually. The usual? Uh, this one is difficult, Phil. She's, um, she's getting uh, too possessive, you know what I mean? <laughs> when are you ever going to learn? It's the last time, Phil, I promise you. I promise me. Yeah. But I need a couple of days to smooth things out. So you want me to phone Mara? Please, tell her I'm away, doing a big job for the circus, blowing up the Kremlin or something. I'll be back on Monday. OK, Toby. Leave it to me. Thanks, Phil. Excellent, Toby. He's a born liar, isn't he? I damn near believed him myself. Now, Toby, about this house. What house? The one Percy bought, out of the witchcraft budget. Where did you get that from? The witchcraft accounts. Oliver Lacon let me have him. Lacon? Is he involved? Oh, yes. He's looking for the mole, too, Toby. The same as the rest of us. That house is presumably the contact point for Polyakov? Yes. Well? It's in Camden Town, actually. Where in Camden Town? Five lock gardens. Thank you, Toby. Is there built-in audio? What do you think? And a caretaker? Hmm. Millie McCraig. So Mrs. McCraig keeps house and runs the recording equipment? Sure. And what's the procedure for contacting Polyakov for a crash meeting? Polly drives to and from the embassy past the house we have on Haverstock Hill, actually. If we put a yellow poster in the window protesting against the traffic, that's the signal. What about at night or at weekends? Wrong number phone call, but nobody likes that. Has it ever been used? I don't know. You mean you don't listen to his phone? Well, I... Uh... Come in. Ah, Fawn, come in. You wanted to see me, sir? I wanted you to meet Mr. Esterhazy. He'll be uh, staying on here for a few days as our house guest. Oh, that should be very pleasant for you, sir. We'll do our best to make you comfortable. Thank you. Uh, what about the other gentleman, sir? He'll be leaving shortly. Very good. What other gentleman? Who else is there? Ricky Tarr. But he's a defector. You know that, Peter? According to Percy... George disagrees. He came to us because he didn't trust anyone at the circus, Toby. Can you blame him? You know something, George, I'm not sure which side I'm supposed to be on anymore. Poor Toby. It must be very confusing for you. I shall ask only one more favour of you. What's that? Fawn? Yes, sir? I want Mr. Esterhazy to ring Millie McCraig tomorrow afternoon, about tea time. Say about 4.30. Very good, sir. I want him to tell Millie McCraig to expect us within the hour to test the recording equipment. All right, Toby? Sure, George. Anything. And make sure it is Millie McCraig before you let him open his mouth. Well, of course, sir. Come on, Peter. I want to talk to Ricky. Coming. And when he does speak for him, make sure he doesn't say more than he should. Don't worry, sir. I'm sure Mr. Esterhazy will wish to avoid unpleasantness. Won't you, sir?
Ricky, it's me, Peter Gillen. Open up. You and who else? George Smiley. Hang on. Hello, Ricky. We bring glad tidings. Where's Fawn? Uh, that's the glad tidings. He's downstairs. He's got a new charge, Ricky. You don't need him anymore. Great. So, uh, have you found the mole yet? Well, not quite. We've narrowed the field down to three people. Who? Bland, Hayden, Alaline. Christ, no wonder I nearly got my throat cut. You were damn lucky. We need your help now, Ricky. To do what? To narrow the field down to one. And you can settle some old scores at the same time. Yeah, I owe Irina that much. What do you want me to do? How would you like to spend a long weekend in Paris? On the firm. Great. When do I go? Tonight. You take Fawn's car and drive to Harwich, overnight ferry to the Hook of Holland, and drive down to Paris from there. And what about a passport? Use your own. That's a bit risky, isn't it? Well, perhaps, but they're still looking for Mr Poole coming in, not Mr Tarr going out. Anyway, I'll see you onto the boat in case you run into problems. After that, you're on your own. That's the way I like it. You know the circus resident in Paris, I believe. Do I? He was your old boss and mentor. Steve McElvoy? Hmm. Hasn't he retired yet? He's got about three months to run. I contact him? Yes. And do what? Exactly what you did in Hong Kong. Send a cable? Mm-hmm. To the circus? Yes. Offering them vital information, wasn't it? Information vital to the safeguarding of the service. Perfect. Oh, yes, I like it, Mr Smiley. That'll really put the cat among the pigeons. Isley Hotel, can I help you? It's Mr. George here. Hello, dear. Is Mr. Mendley in, would you know? Yes, I believe he is. Would you like to speak to him? Please. Hang on, dear. I'll put you through. <coughs> Room nine. Mendel is Mr. George. Hello. How's tricks? Fine, thank you. We got my nephew away on time. No collie wobbles? No. He's looking forward to meeting his friend. Good. I just wanted to let you know that Auntie and I won't be back until tomorrow morning. Oh, I won't wait up, then. But we are hoping to throw a little party tomorrow evening. I like parties. We'll have a few arrangements to make first, of course. Of course. Should be fun. Until tomorrow, then. Bye. George? Here, Peter. Ah, no problem parking? No. In the side road there, beyond the first street light. Good. Have you done a recce? Hmm. Lock Gardens is a cul-de-sac. Number five is the house at the end. Uh, it would be. It's well chosen, Peter. Practically impossible to keep under surveillance. Yes. Well, let's get on with it, shall we? I'll go first, Peter. You stay here for a minute or two. What for? I want you to watch my back. Watch you? Are you serious? Maybe I'm imagining things, but you can't be too careful. Okay. I'll give you a 60 second start. Ooh, come on, Millie. Just a minute, just a minute. Yes? Hello, Mrs. McCraig. Mr. Smiley, what brings you here? Didn't Mr. Esterhazy tell you I was coming? Oh, I but he didn't say it was you. He just said it'd be an old friend. Come in, come in. Thank you. Are you by yourself? No, Peter Gillam should be along in a minute or two. I heard you'd left the service. Retired, was it? Well, sort of semi-retired. And uh, now you've come to check the wiring or some such? That's right. On Mr. Esterhazy's authority? No, on Mr. Oliver Lakin's. Oh. If you have any worries, Mrs. McCraig, any worries at all, you can reach Mr. Lakin on this number, here. I see. But you're to ring no one else. Is that clear? Oh, very. That'll be Peter Gillam. Oh, I'll go and let him in. Ah, uh -huh, it is him. Hello, Millie, my love. Long time no see. Oh, George. Oh, all right. Not a sniff. Good. Now, Mrs. McCraig. Perhaps you could explain the setup here to us. Well, there isn't one really. All the meetings are held on the ground floor drawing room. 
And where are the microphones? Uh, one on each wall, embedded in the wallpaper. Voice activated? Uh, of course. And the tape recorders, where are they? In the attic. So you have to go up to the attic to man the equipment every time there's a meeting? No, they turn it on themselves. How? There's a switch in the drawing room. Uh, show me. If you wouldn't mind, Mrs McCraig. Uh-huh. Well, uh, in here, then. Incidentally, what are your safety procedures here? Two full milk bottles on the front step and all's well. No milk bottles keep out. Uh, there's the switch. Ah, yeah. uh, uh, double. Ah, and the right-hand one is for the light and the left is for the recorder. So the moment you put the switch down, you're live. That's it. Yeah, we'll soon fix that. Here, what's he up to? I'm just reversing the... A switch. But he's not to do that. Tell him to stop at once. You have Oliver Lakeham's number, Mrs McCraig. Aye, and I'm away to speak with him now. This is outrageous, absolutely outrageous. Poor Millet. If only she knew the truth, her blood would turn to ice. Yeah, I thought it did years ago. Oh, there. Yeah, it's too simple, really. Just put the switch back upside down and... Uh, hey, presto. And they think it's on, it'll be off, and vice versa. When you're finished here, we'd better test it, just to make sure. Yeah. What's the time? Um, 5.30, a little after. Then it's 6.30 in Paris. Don't worry. Ricky knows what he has to do. Hello, Mr. McElvoy. What? Ricky? Easy now, Mr. McElvoy. What the hell are you doing here? Lock the door. You're not going anywhere. What's all this about? Just do as I say. Gently now. Don't make me nervous. What the devil have you been up to, Ricky boy? The whole damn circus is after your blood. Is there anyone still inside the building? Only the duty cipher clerk. Locked in. What do you think? But he'll open up if you tell him. Oh, for God's sake, Ricky. Come on. And no tricks. Or you won't live to collect your pension. You're out of your mind, Ricky. London will have you hide for this. Shut up. Where's the cipher room? Here. You sure there's no one here but the cipher clerk? Positive. OK. No tricks, mind. <coughs> Open up, then. It's me, Steve McElvoy. Hello, Mr McElvoy. I thought you'd gone home. No, I came back. I have to talk to London urgently. Just a minute, sir. Excuse me. Uh, uh, hey, who are you? It's all right, Ben. This gentleman's an old friend. One of my more distinguished contacts. Yes, sir. Leave the books where they are, Ben. Put the keys in the machine, then you can go. Buzz off home. Thank you, sir. Ben stays, OK? But Mr McElvoy said I could go. Don't argue with him, Ben. He's got a gun. Huh? You can put your hands down, Ben. We're all friends here. Thank you. All we're going to do is code up a simple little message for London. Aren't we, Mr McElvoy? If you say so. I do. And I also say we're going to keep our hands where I can see them. I might get very twitchy if someone makes a sudden move. What time do you make it now, Peter? Uh, exactly three minutes later than the last time you asked. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I always find this the most difficult time, the waiting. I'll get it, George. Yes? Tisilski. We're just leaving. Good. You're at Five Lock Gardens, right? Right. It's a cul-de-sac. Great. So keep well clear. Don't worry. I'll call you when we're in position, OK? Fine. Nick Tisilski. They're just leaving. Who's he got with him? The best I could lay hands on at short notice. Nick, Casper, Jeff Hatton. Good. So, it's all down to Ricky Tarr now. Just hope he hasn't hit any snags. Stop worrying, George. Something should be happening by now. It probably is. Now what? George, for God's sake, come away from that window. Mm. What are you looking for? I don't know. I've just got this, this feeling. Well, that's nerves. Yes, yes, you're probably right. Perhaps we should check with Mendel and make sure the line's open. He said he'd ring us. Yes, I know. Where exactly is he, anyway? An apartment right opposite the circus. Oh, very convenient. How did he come by that, I wonder? <laughs> I shudder to think. The special browns seem to inhabit a sort of demimonde of their own. You can say that again. Ah. Hello? Things are beginning to happen. 
One's just clocked in. Who? Well, it looks like Alaline. How did he seem? Agitated. I'm not surprised. Oh, hang on. There's a car just turned up. Oh, no. It's just going past. What sort of car? No, no, no. He stopped. It's an old Rover. Silver grey. That'll be Roy Bland. I've got the glasses on him now. Heavy set, ginger hair. That's him. One to come, then. Well, Bill's always late. Is he? I'll tell you what, keep the line open. I'll give you a shout when something happens, right? Thank you. Well, Peter, the vultures are gathering. What will they do now? If Hong Kong's anything to go by, they'll try to stall Ricky, keep him pinned down in the residency. Yes, they've got a bearing on him at last. And that's what we're banking on, Peter. The mole's got to alert Moscow, urgently. Hello? Hello? Sorry, Mendel. A cab's just pulled up outside the circus. Yeah. Yep, it looks like your third man's arrived. The gang's all here. Thank you. Here it comes. Looks brief and to the point. Unbutton it, Ben. That's a good lad. It's from Allerline, personal to you. Mm. It's on the tape, too, isn't it? Yeah, of course. And then bung it through the machine, the decryptor or whatever you call it. But it's a flash. Decipher yourself. Do it, Ben. Yes, Mr. McElroy. You really are off the chump, Ricky. No one in their right mind is going to swallow your story. Then why are they trying to kill me? It's not the bloody Russians who are trying to kill you, it's us. It comes to the same thing, doesn't it? Read it, Ben. So that Mr. McElvoy here knows exactly what's happening. <clears throat> um, personal for Tar from Allerline. Decipher yourself. Require clarification and or trade samples before meeting your request. Quote, information vital to safeguarding of the service, unquote, does not qualify. <laughs> Urge you confide McElvoy immediately. Repeat immediately. Stop. He's stalling again. That's what he's doing. Stalling why he measures me up for a coffin, just the way he did for Irina. Irina? Who's she? Yeah, Percy's playing the same old tune, the bastard. But we'll show him. Won't we, Ben? Uh, beg pardon, sir. Dasilski's party should be here by now. Give them time. Are you sure that walkie-talkie thing's working? Please, George. We've got Mendel on the other end of the phone watching the circus. We've got time on our hands and everything's under control. Nick to Pete. Nick to Peter. Do you read me? Over. There you are. Peter to Nick. Pete to Nick. Loud and clear. Over. We're in position. What news? Over. Sit tight. We'll keep you posted. Out. Oh, that's a relief. Mendel, are you there? With you. Anything happening? Oh, one or two lights going on off, otherwise nothing. No one's left the building. Keep your eyes on that entrance. If you miss him, we'll be in trouble. Don't worry. Stay by the phone a minute, Peter. Sure. George, you've spent half the evening peering out of that damned window. What's got into you? I'm not sure. I'm, uh, I'm just uneasy. There's no one there, I promise you. Mm. If there was, I'd have seen him. I was watching your back all the way. Hello? Hello? Oh. What is it? A taxi's just arrived. Hang on. Stand by, George. What's happening? Shh. Yeah, one of them's just left. Which one? Couldn't see. He was hidden by the taxi. Damn. Heading north, though. Your direction. Thanks. Well, Peter? I think Mole Gerald's on his way. Will there be anything more to send, sir? Let's wait and see. Some of us have got homes to go to, Ricky boy. How much longer do you intend keeping us here? Just until the next message comes through, Mr. McElvoy. No longer, I promise you. One more? Saying what, exactly? Oh, I don't know. How about... The mole is dead. Long live Ricky Tarr. <laughs> You've got a hope. There's no sign of him yet, Mendel. He ought to be with you by now. Maybe he's not the mole, after all. He must be. Taxi's just arrived, George. He's here, Mendel. Signing off now. Roger. Good luck. Pete to Nick. The first one's arrived. Roger. Where do I plug in the headset? There. I can't hear anything. He won't have switched on yet. Oh, of course. You won't hear anything until he thinks he's switching it off. Ah, oh, yes. There it is. 
What's he doing? Just pacing about. You think it's Mole, Gerald? Almost certainly. Another taxi. Must be Polyakov. Pete to Nick. The second one's arrived. Stand by. Roger. Standing by. What's that? Tradecraft. He's bringing in the milk bottles. Anyone in? He's just coming to the drawing room. What's happening? Polyakov's reciting their cover story. What about the mole? He hasn't spoken yet. Shh. George, what is it? What's the matter? Nothing. I've heard enough. All right, Peter, you can call him in now. Pete to Nick. Move, move, move. Roger, on our way. Come on, Peter. I suppose we'd better make ourselves known. You okay, George? Yes, of course. I'll let the others in. I'm sorry to interrupt you, gentlemen. George, who are you? Alexei Alexandrovich Polyakov, I presume. Uh, yes, but... Or do you prefer Colonel Viktorov of the 13th Directorate? They're here, George. Thank you, Peter. Allow me to introduce you to Mole Gerald. Bill Hayden. Right this way, Colonel. Pussy, take your hands off me! I protest as violation of I'm diplomatic sorry, status. I'm sorry, Colonel Viktorov, but the diplomatic status is accorded to Councillor Polyakov. I am Polyakov, I tell you. Let me go, Miss Savitz. Here you get. Where are you taking me? To the funny farm. Where else? I protest. I wish to speak with Soviet ambassador. Will be okay, there. take him away. Six to four. He'll be back in Moscow within forty-eight hours. And Bill Hayden. They'd hang him if I had my way. They won't, though. They never do. No. He'll be put on ice and traded for one of the agents he helped to blow. Hmm. We'd better get him to the interrogators, I suppose. And give him a minute. He's making his last confession to George. Moscow is trying to position Percy to take over from control. I see. Witchcraft was Carla's idea. It may be hard for you to admit, George, but... The whole concept was classic. I wouldn't disagree. Percy was the front man. I slipstreamed behind him. Roy and Toby did the legwork. None of them knew. And Operation Testify? Presumably that was your own idea. Yes. But that was a desperate throw. I knew Control suspected a mole. All that digging about in the files. And it was getting close. Too close. Was Stefchik's offer genuine, by the way? Good Lord, no. No, it was a fix from the start that we had to be certain control would rise to the bait. And who he would send to Czechoslovakia, presumably. That, too. It had to be a big gun, someone who wasn't witchcraft cleared. And someone who was a Czech speaker. Yes. I've been through all the files, all the correspondence back over the years. I knew you and Jim Prido were close. I never realized how close. Yes. Blood Brothers, you wrote once. I got him back, damn it. Yes. Yes, you did. That was very good of you. Don't bloody well patronise me, George. Sorry. I shall have to break it to Anne, of course. Is there anything in particular you want me to say to her? She's your wife. She always was. Yes. I'm sorry about that. It was Carla's idea. He reckoned that if it was known that I was Anne's lover, you wouldn't see straight when it came to other things. Point? Point. Time he was going, George. Yes. Yes, of course. OK, Bill. Coming. You all right, George? Fine. Carla thought you were quite good, actually, George. Thank you. He always said... You were the biggest threat, but you had this one prize, Anne. Come on, Hayden. Take no notice, George. All clear? No. OK, bring him up. You sure you're all right? Stop him! Stop that What's car! that? Sounds like a shot. Come on, George. Man. Come on. No, Peter, no, right. you go. Stay with him. Right, right. Mr. Gillum, Mr. Gillum! Yeah? Trouble. Someone took a pot shot Hayden. Yeah, we heard. Who was it? Did you see? Too dark. He was in an old jag, parked at the top of the street. Bill, is Bill all right? 
He's dead, Mr. Smiley. Oh, my God. What were you playing at? Didn't you have him covered? Yeah, we weren't expecting this, were we? Oh, my God, well, move, man. Get after him. Right away. Sorry, Mr. Smiley. Yes, thank you. I'll give up. Sorry if they don't get him. But it's all right. They aren't to blame. I don't understand, George. Apart from us, who else knew Hayden would be here? It's of no consequence, Peter. Not now. You knew George, didn't you? You knew this would happen. No, but I should have done. I should have known. After all, Bill once said they were blood brothers. <laughs>